Okay, uh, I think we should start. Uh, hello and welcome to everyone to Unseen Trends in Biotechnology. Uh, so today we have with us Mr. Sajjal Kapoor. And just before we uh, jump into the introduction, there are some uh, there, there are some standard rules that uh, that we'll be talking about. So uh, one thing is for sure that the webinar is going to last for more than three hours. So we'll be taking two short we'll be taking two short breaks in the webinar. And the second thing is that the webinar can last well beyond uh, three hours, including Q and A's. So the questions can be asked either in, in Hindi or in English. So we are comfortable in both the languages. Third thing, is, third thing is that the recording will be made available within 72 hours. So please be patient with us. And uh, fourth thing is that the questions can be answered both in English and Hindi. And uh, again, a massive thank you to each and every one of you for, for, for contributing to the, to, to the cause. More than uh, two thousand people have uh, more than two uh, two thousand people have already uh, like uh, contributed to Perfect Foundation, which I think is a massive achievement for each and every one of you. And for the, for those of you who do not know what Perfect Found Foundation does, so uh, Perfect Foundation has been feeding more than two thousand people a day for, for for the last four years, and uh, cumulatively they uh, they have uh, given more than twenty lakh meals as of now, and they also operate an entire hospital ward at Ames. Which I think, uh, which I think is a great cause for each and everyone to be involved with, right? And uh, just before we start, so just an introduction of Sajal sir. So Sajal Kapoor is an operational risk and regulatory compliance consultancy professional with over two decades of industry experience, working for banks, healthcare, and investment firms. He's also a passionate investor, always hunting for that unseen undervaluation, like all of us already know as of now. Over the years, both his profession and investing journey have taught him some precious lessons, including the benefits of staying inside your core competence, the power of discipline, uh, the power of discipline, patience, and time. Sajal did his MBA from Manchester Business School in 2010 and currently stays in London with his family. He is active on Twitter, as we already know, with the handle name Unseen Value. Uh, sir, I'll just give you the right to present. I think uh, you sure. can start. Yeah, thanks, um, Ishmael, for a, a very kind and generous um, uh, opening um, uh, sort of introduction on on me. I just wanted to do this, guys, because uh, my roots are Indian. I wanted to just contribute something back to the society, and I found this wonderful platform in um, SOIC and also Perfect Foundation. Uh, I know Mr. Ashish Kila um, and Perfect Foundation. They are doing a fantastic um, uh, work in India. Their objectives are. Uh, are very um, uh, benevolent as well, and we wish them all the very best um, in everything that they are doing in this uh, challenging times that the the country is facing. Uh, but you know, this too shall pass away, as they say. So we will come out um, much stronger as a country once this pandemic is all um, done and dusted, and and we will um, you know get to the other end. There is definitely light um, at the end of the tunnel. So I'll try and um, share my presentation. Right. Right, so it's visible to us. It's visible, right, okay. Right, it's visible. Let me just minimize this. Okay. Right, so... Um, Biotechnology, uh, we believe, um, I believe it's an accelerating uh, non-linear um, change going uh, forward. Uh, sorry about that. So um, industry 1.0 um, or 1.0 was all about um, steam power and mechanization. Um, then came um, 2.0, which was all about assembly line uh, mass production, then 3.0 was all about uh, computing, um, electronics, automation. We are currently in uh, industry 4.0, but I believe that the trans transition to industry uh, 5 uh, vision 2.0 is already uh, happening. Uh, the world today is looking for sustainable uh, solutions um, in everything. Um, we consume from energy uh, to food and everything in between. Uh, but when you look at biotechnology as a space, I think the majority of uh, research, the work, the innovation that has happened has 
been in the area of um, life sciences, um, including agriculture um, and human. And there is uh, very little or almost um, no biotechnology impact um, outside this. Yes, there has been some on the industrial um, biotechnology side, um, but I think there is much more um, to go because if you look at, uh, and this is available on Google, if you just Google industry 5.0 vision 2, you'd find that the motto itself is all about bioeconomy. And the motivation, as I said, is all about sustainability because the way we are progressing in terms of greenhouse gases um, and not recycling um, kind of speaks volumes in terms of you know where the, the planet um, is, is heading. Uh, so the focus is everything about renewable um, sources and sustainability, recycling, sustainable agriculture and production. Um, so maybe getting away from um, chemical based um, uh, pesticides using biotechnology to um, gene editing and um, um, biotechnology to sort of increase the productivity um, of um, agriculture produce and make the plants more uh, resistant and so we have case studies um, further on on those areas so overall i believe that the impact um, of um, biotechnology will be uh, much um, wider and deeper um, and, and it will span across uh, multiple sectors and it will go on for multiple decades. So we are not talking about a trend which will fizzle out in a year or two. This will be a multi-decadal um, growth opportunity and there will be many, many um, investment opportunities along the way. Uh, we have to just uh, reassess our current um, portfolio from an investing perspective and see where we stand and how we can best uh, position to sort of leverage the, the enormous growth uh, which will be unfolding. I mean, just look at these numbers, right? Uh, by 2025, the Indian bioeconomy itself is expected to be 100 to 150 billion. Now, 20 to 30 percent of this 100 to 150 billion will just be industrial biotechnology. And these are just the Indian numbers. Imagine the worldwide opportunity. Um, and many of these um, countries, both India and outside India, uh, where we have, you know, uh, further details um, in this presentation, they they are uh, they are doing a, a massive, creating a massive impact, and their their jurisdiction is 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 global. Um, so the opportunity is is significantly bigger than you know what the size of those um, organizations are today, both in terms of their uh, revenues or sales as well as the, the market cap. <clears throat> so um, I presented my seven pillar framework um, in a couple of webinars last year. So this is this is more like of a distilled um, sort of uh, version of that. Uh, but I think these are the three core pillars that um, I use um, as part of my investment and screening criteria. Uh, starting with the, the management. Um, so yes, they have to be uh, competent and trustworthy. Uh, for sure um, and how do you assess that so yes you need to go through several cycles and um, to sort of fine tune fine tune your um, understanding of the management but in simple terms you have to see what they have been talking about those annual reports or uh, con calls or, or publicly uh, available documents over the years and see you know whether they have been walking the talk or not you have to look at their capital allocation track record you know any major red flags in terms of fraud or misconduct and and skin in the game so skin in the game i think sometimes people confuse that the promoter holding should be 70 percent 60 percent or 75 percent i think if it's a if it's a micro cap let's say 100 crore um, rupees worth of the total business and even if the promoter has got 75 percent stake um that's that's peanuts, right? That's that's not what I would call a skin in the game. So 75% holding in a in a micro cap is not a skin in the game, and because they may be having some other unlisted businesses as well. 10% holding in a large cap, uh, or 15%, 20% holding in a in a in a in a decent sized uh, mid sized organization, is 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 actually a skin in the game, assuming that that's the only um, business or enterprise that they have. Um, so once the management is all um, taken care of, um, the next um, critical thing that I watch out for is the industry structure and, and big multi-baggers. So you're talking about 25x, 50x, 100x, uh, typically happen when the starting industry structure is terrible. 
So you are in a basement sort of scenario. And from there, you slowly transform uh, to go to the top tier. So the examples that I've listed here, so chemicals as a sector. Uh, and... sir, uh, sir, uh, sir, just before we proceed, I think jo aapka earphone ka mic hai, wo aapki jo jacket ki zippers ke lag lag ke, so it is creating some sound. So, All right, okay, no right, worries. Right. Yeah. And now it, now it isn't. That, oh, thank sure. you. Really sorry. Sure. No, no, no worries. Yeah, so, um, so industry structure, if possible, the starting industry structure should be terrible uh, because then you get the, the maximum um, alpha creation um, like we have seen in some of the chemical uh, sector, specialty chemicals in India. In 2011 or 2012, uh, the industry structure was terrible. I mean, no one was um, you know, willing to invest in the sector um, because the rear view um, mirror was um, terrible. Um, the ROE was, was bad. The, there was no ROC, significant ROC, they, they barely um, equal to the cost of capital. Um, there was no significant wealth creation in the sector either. So the industry structure was terrible. And then that point in time, the, the China blue sky policy kicked in and you know, significant transformation happened on the industry structure. And, and we know what has happened since then. I mean, we have had many examples that are of 50x, 60x. I mean, Alkyla mine I know is an outlier, which is about 140x in the last 10 years alone. But there have been significant wealth creators like PI Industries, Naveen Florine, you know, um, Atul is, is another one. Uh, we, we've got we've got many such examples. Um, so this is this is a, a good um, sort of um, reference or a case study. I, I can give you another example from the IT industry way back in the 90s and early 2000. Uh, the industry structure was very positive. Is it still is good, but um, IT was a very new industry back then, just like biotechnology perhaps is today. And whosoever found the right combo of industry structure and management, they they made a 10, 20 year um, run, um, despite the 9-11 and the GFC crisis and everything. So take Infosys as an example, take Wipro as an example, TCS wasn't listed back then. But whosoever got the management wrong, um, they still made money as long as they got out um, in time. And there were, there were several businesses that were serious multi-beggars I'm talking about, 10x, 20x, some were even 50, 100x um, in, in just a manner of five, six years, but they perished. So HFCL, Global Tele, Penta Media, Silver Line, DSQ. So I'm sure those of you who have been um, investing in that era know uh, what I'm talking about, but those businesses, uh, we don't find them today. So Infosys is still around, Wipro is still around, but those businesses are not um, around or, or you know, much um, weak, like so HFCL that we see today is not the HFCL of late 90s and early 2000, right? So clearly the management was not um, A grade, the industry structure was same for everyone. Uh, so you have to get the combination of management as well as the industry structure right and even if the business economics are not superior on day one. So let's take uh, Wipro as an example. Uh, it was an oil company, right? The, so Western India Palm um, Oil, uh, that was, that was the, the name of Wipro. So fundamentally speaking, it wasn't a great business. It was either a bad business or an average business, but the management was A grade. They got the industry structure right. The tailwind was there. And they created, I think Wipro went up from almost nowhere to almost 300x in that five year period from mid 90s to 2000. Um, so again, you have to look at the management and industry structure and then see the business, even if the business is an average, a great management with um, industry um, tailwind can transform it uh, from an average business. Like we have seen with all these chemical players. I mean, they were, they were at best average businesses, right? But today um, they are seen as um, having, you know, serious competitive advantage more. Um, they figure in almost every um, great PMS uh, uh, fund uh, portfolio. Uh, and I believe that API industry is a good example um, um, drawing parallels from chemicals because if you look at the, the 20 year period between 1999 and 2019, uh, APIs were hated. Uh, no one was willing to put any money um, on this sector. Uh, it was completely, you know, a bombed out uh, sector with no investment, no interest whatsoever. There was no 
chatter on social media it was all about nbfcs and hfcs and, and and all the rest of it no one was interested to look into the crams or the 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 apis and the complex apis space but starting 2020 um, we have seen some um, visible changes so the stock prices are up no no doubt but look at the fundamentals have they improved have the roes gone gone up roc is gone up where loris lab was maybe a two years ago or maybe a year ago and where the the roe rocs are um, are, are today uh, right so significant transformation has happened but i believe that the runway is 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 a lot longer um, so i'm just giving you a few examples to um, use these to then assess you know where biotechnology can go in the next 20 30 years and look at the serious wealth um, uh, creation the potential for wealth creation ahead of us and finally on the business economic side i generally uh, prefer businesses that are producing something which is either critical or essential so you guys have seen me speak about cdmos a lot even fmcgs um, apis so i look for critical and essential product or service specialty chemicals a lot of those uh, who are into custom synthesis they offer an essential product or service right and then i look for high entry barriers for competitors but more importantly i look for high exit barriers for customers as well so there has to be a lock in so for example in a cdmo business once once you have got the cell lines developed and you have got the customer um, locked in they will not switch because the tech transfer itself is 6 months and it's all patent driven business the clock is ticking no one takes that risk of filing again and you know facing those regulatory hurdles potentially um, so you have to look at both the the high entry barriers as well as the high exit barriers and low cyclicality in cash flow see no business is completely immune if there is a massive down cycle barring the essentials like soaps and shampoos and basic medicines everything will suffer even hospital business will take a hit so there is nothing like a zero cyclicality business um, but some businesses like animal healthcare as an example they are they are better they offer very low cyclicality and there is data to prove that even during the worst um, uh, crisis like great financial crisis etc the animal health care the fmcg the basic health care and the, the the medicines etc they are very sticky in terms of the demand uh, and the consumption um, and and the predictability and the sustainability of of workflow so i i consistently try and use this uh, framework um, to position uh, my my investments uh, for a for a longer i i typically don't trade so one if i buy something i i buy and hold um as long as um i can uh, so if i need money i have to sell or if there is a change in the thesis um, either on the management side or the business economics or the industry structure then i either uh, trim my position or or exit or if i find you know something ridiculously overvalued so something is at 15 to 20 times price to sales with peak margins peak roc and everything i try and um position out of that business and into something where i believe that the starting valuations are are cheap because the roc is is in single digit uh, the ro is is low but something is fundamentally changing in the business so that 5 to 10 years out people will be following a b line for those businesses so that's the only time i uh, only other reason when i um, um, try and uh, reduce my exposure or exit otherwise buy and hold typically works um, well for me so we shared that previously and again we have tweeted so we know uh, we are covering the entire universe of the biotechnology space um i have made um, an attempt to not you know exclude anything uh, with relevant examples um, and that's the reason i'm saying that you know it will take uh, approximately 3 hours to cover everything from start to finish um so um starting with um, genomics and diagnostics uh, so inside the the nucleus of uh, every cell the the dna is bundled into um, chromosomes that make up the the genome uh, and the genome is something that holds the instructions for everything um, that uh, our body performs from you know growing that toe when we were uh, an embryo to building that brain and and keeping it functional 
um, to digesting food, um, walking, running, every single thing that we do, the instructions are coded, they are written in, in the genome. And if you use a, a really powerful microscope and you zoom into um, the DNA, you would find that uh, we have got, so, so our alphabets have got 26 letters, right? Whereas DNA is, is written with just four um, characters. So uh, these are the nucleotides, the adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. So, and, and the entire genome is um, coded like this, A, T, 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 C, Z, Z. So that, that's how the, the genome um, uh, would look like. And, and if you were to read the whole genome uh, operating manual, so to speak, um, if you want to read it uh, out loud, it will take you uh, more than five decades. 57 years um, is, is how long it would take you to read all those. Um, uh, so three billion base pairs are there. So uh, base, play, base pair is an adenine would pair with um, a thymine and, and, and cytosine would pair with guanine. So there are three billion base pairs. So six billion of these letters in total in the entire um, genome. And that's why it will take you 57 years if you want to read it um, um, out loud. Uh, so coming to the genetic similarities between various species. So uh, humans are 99.9% um, uh, they match with each other. Uh, and then there are other species as well. Uh, in the preclinical um, studies, um, the, the, the mice model are, are preferred in the preclinical because Although the total genome matches only 85% between a mouse and a human, um, there are certain genes um, in, the, in mice uh, that are um, almost 99% uh, match uh, with, uh, with humans. And they have a very similar uh, immune system, uh, nervous system, cardiovascular system. Um, they breed very easily and their size is small. Um, and their cost of acquisition for these uh, CROs and CDMOs is, is relatively um, cheaper compared to a chimpanzee. So both on the si size and the fact that they breed very fast, um, they give a, you know, a very um, excellent sort of uh, mice uh, model in preclinical um, drug uh, testing. And that's the reason um, most of the time they are preferred over any other species. So um, as I said, genome is your operating manual. So every single instruction is coded in that genome. Um, the command center is, is of course the nucleus where uh, you find the, the DNA um, uh, there. Chromosomes, uh, we know we have got um, 23 pairs, 46 chromosomes in total. So 22 of those 23 pairs, we get one from um, both our parents and the, the, the 23rd pair is our um, uh, the gender chromosome, so XX um, and then XY, of course. Um, and so DNA is the blueprint, as I said. So every, every single instruction um, is coded, um, as you can see. So it's T A C T T C A A uh, in this example. And there is something called uh, mRNA or messenger RNA. Uh, and the, the DNA has... So imagine an analogy where DNA has got all the recipe to um, produce all the proteins and that will keep your body uh, up and running, but they cannot um, participate in any sort of protein synthesis or production because they live inside nucleus uh, or this bunker, uh, so to speak. So it's the messenger RNA that transcribes or copies that instruction. And then it leaves the bunker or the nucleus um, it steps out and then participates um, in the synthesis um, of, um, of the protein. And each um, word is a three letter. So, so A, uh, T, A, C, that's one word, T, T, C, A, A, A. So these are all um, words within, uh, within, within our genome. And think of the, the role of um, gene. Uh, so if, if genome is your entire um, operating manual, the gene is like, um, a single sentence which does a specific thing, i.e. the creation of the protein. So gene is made up of several of these three letter words um, as, as shown in the example. And, and each of these will um, create, uh, you know, um, each of these genes will create a protein. So, and, and they are nothing but a chain of um, amino acids. So you can see that 
um, illustration here where we say the, the 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 transcription instructions that are passed to the the ribosomes where the the synthesis of the uh, the proteins would happen will say do an amino acid do an amino acid amino acid is stop and and whenever there is any sort of mutation which is a programming error or a syntax error in this code um, the protein synthesis will be incorrect either you will get an incorrect protein so for example the sickle cell disease which is the 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 incorrect hemoglobin protein which is not transporting the oxygen the way it should or the protein synthesis will be completely uh, missing so it could be a um, visually impaired person from from childhood because they are not getting that protein synthesis um, as an example so there is a defect in their uh, gene so it could either be a bad protein or no protein at all and and those are the conditions typically and that would result from gene mutation and they they would lead to rare diseases um, and then molecular diagnostics or genomic diagnostics is the science that uh, goes through um, the entire um, genomic sequence and the all 6000 letters um, precisely or 3 billion base pairs and they, they try and figure out you know what are the potential uh, causes or the nature of this disease and what could potential what could be a potential prognosis and the treatment um, for for those we'll look um, at um, a relevant example as well and we'll look um, into further uh, molecular diagnostics um, in the next couple of slides and finally um, um, the the genetic material of a virus is typically a dna um, but some viruses like um, retrovirus or coronavirus, the genetic material is the RNA. Now, we just saw that um, there is a transcription process where the instructions coded in the DNA are transcribed into messenger RNA. But viruses where the genetic material is not DNA rather than RNA, um, there is a possibility that reverse transcription could take place, which kind of um, goes against the whole um, one-way traffic thesis of information flowing from DNA to um, messenger RNA. So in case of those viruses, so coronaviruses is an RNA virus, the, in, the, the information um, could, um, uh, so it's called reverse transcription, it could flow from the RNA and it could um, change the, the genome uh, potentially in some cases as well. Uh, so, so those are, um, those are the, the, um, the RNA viruses like coronavirus is one. And if you look at RT-PCR, so we have seen this many times. Here is a representation of this coronavirus, this, this, the, the COV-2, which has been uh, mutating, right? So the, the recent uh, triple uh, uh, mutation or the Bengal strain uh, sometimes referred to is, is, is very um, uh, infective. So it's the, the R, R value is, is much more uh, higher. And these viruses, they mutate as they spread in a population. And not every mutation is, is, is more le lethal or deadly. So mutation could make it um, more benign or it could make the virus more lethal uh, as well. Uh, but that, that depends on you know, what exactly has uh, mutated. And as it spreads, um, the mutations will, will keep happening. And this RT-PCR test is, is, so RT is the reverse in transcription. Uh, so what they do is they take the, the RNA and they, they sort of reverse transcribe it into the DNA. They, they then multiply that DNA into millions and then they perform the RT-PCR. So PCR is the polymerase and chain reaction. You know, any university biology student would know what this is, um, but basically they do this to um, test whether you are um, uh, COVID positive or not. But what we have seen with these uh, mutations is that sometimes the, the RT-PCR test is giving a, 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 a false negative. So you have, um, you're showing the symptom, you have um, uh, the COVID virus inside your body, but the RT-PCR is not um, telling you because the virus is mutated. So the test has to be, you know, reconfigured to, to make sure that um, the detection is proper. Uh, so I've seen that doctors in India and elsewhere, they have started relying more on the, the symptom rather than just the, the RT-PCR report. Uh, and there have been cases I was reading in newspaper in India as well recently where the symptom was there, but the, the, the RT-PCR test was, uh, was negative. 
So I just um, made this up um, as a as a simple analogy because I presume most of you are not from scientific background and you have just um, come to um, assess the investment potential of this space. So imagine there is a construction blueprint, uh, a factory has to be created and the construction blueprint has got all the instructions needed to create the factory. So walls, doors, windows, plant, installation, machinery and anything that you could think of. Uh, but the blueprint itself um, won't do anything. So the project coordinator would read those instructions and then it will um, communicate that uh, to the construction workers who would build those doors, the windows and everything. So as an analogy, your construction blueprint is your DNA, which is the blueprint of life. Your um, project coordinator is your messenger RNA that leaves the the nucleus and, and the ribosomes are those construction workers that prepare those proteins. So a door is, is a protein, uh, a window is a protein. So anything that is being constructed or, or built um, is, is a protein. And then here we, I've, I've shown, you know, how the whole chain works from making the protein to folding it and to, to sort and package the protein and the transportation uh, um, and, and here is the actual uh, representation, more, more scientific representation is, st is step by step, you know, right from the transcription of DNA to messenger RNA and then messenger RNA leaving the, the nucleus um, membrane uh, and then the ribosomes and everything else takes care of the synthesis of uh, the protein. And then it finally leaves um, where, where it has to um, in terms of the, the transportation. So here are some examples of the, the enterprises. Again, this is a very small example. There are many, many um, uh, molecular diagnostics um, companies. Some are very big as you know, like Thermo Fisher as an example, Illumina is one, and, and some are very, very small in size as well. So uh, Map My Genome and Xcode Life, they are India based. They are currently not listed and I've included them so that you could just research more about them should there be an opportunity to invest in them in, in, at some point in future um, at that time. Mammoth Biosciences, interestingly, was started by um, Jennifer Doudna, uh, the lady who got uh, the Nobel Prize for CRISPR, along with uh, the, the French uh, lady, Emmanuel uh, Charpentier. So this Mammoth Biosciences was started by um, Jennifer Doudna. Emmanuel Charpentier started um, uh, floated another uh, very famous um, uh, enterprise called CRISPR Therapeutics. I'm sure you might have heard that name. Uh, and there are other examples. So Verasite is one, We've got a small uh, introduction of that. So they are into um, genomic diagnostic. OncoSTEM is another Indian company. Uh, you might um, want to, um, look. I'm, I'm assuming that most of you are, are from India. Uh, so that's the reason I have included uh, some Indian examples as well. So, so coming to uh, the, the, the molecular uh, diagnostics, um, important thing is um, that the DNA from people of non-European, sorry again. So um, the, the DNA of uh, people from non-European descent is conspicuously missing from um, the genomic research. Um, so 78% of the entire uh, sequencing uh, genomic sequences that have happened so far is from the people of uh, European descent, 78%. 10% uh, are Asian uh, and only 2% are, are African. So what, what we find is again and again, people um, from um, underrepresented background uh, find that the drugs and diagnosis based on the research that makes connections between the DNA and the diseases they don't work on them uh, because it's a medical injustice. Um, ideally, we should have a fair representation of the entire global population, but the way the, the, the genomes have been sequenced so far, majority of them are uh, of the people from European descent. Um, so, and, and the reason the, the sequencing is done is to sort of find the genetic cause of um, some of the diseases or make an early uh, detection of uh, some of the life-threatening diseases like cancer. So one case study, the Vera site where they have got uh, models and so they are, they are planning to come out with a swab test. We can, they can just detect the, the possibility of different types of cancers. Um, 
so that's another um, one potential benefit of having um, your your um, DNS sequenced, or it could just be a case of um, a married couple uh, looking uh, to go for family uh, planning and they want to understand, you know, their own genetic makeup uh, to figure out, you know, um, what sort of um, um, you know um, offspring they will likely have, or or simply. You know, you're just interested in in understanding your um, genomic makeup, and you want to get your uh, genome um, sequenced. the The cost um, has been dropping. So the first um, pro uh, the first human genome was sequenced back in 2003, and it it cost almost three billion. Um, these days, I mean, it's it's well under thousand um, USD, and and I think maybe um, next year, if not later this year, uh, the cost should be very close to $100. And then at that point in time, it will become very affordable. Uh, and we should all be having, you know, our um, um, DNA sequenced um, to help um, in the diagnosis uh, and the prognosis. Um, and then uh, epigenetics um, deals with the study of how your behavior and the external environment, so it could be pollution, it could be your lifestyle, how these uh, factors um, um, change the gene expression um, and, and, and they can introduce some, some diseases. So imagine in a simple term, the DNA being the hardware and the epigenetics is the software on top of it. So the, the genome does the work, uh, but uh, epigenome tells the genome what to do. And, and epigenetic changes are not permanent. So genetic, genetic mutations are permanent and that's where the CRISPR and everything will, will look um, into that uh, a little later uh, comes into play, but epigenetic changes are not permanent. So if you change your lifestyle, if you change your eating habits, if you um, start living in a place which has got lower pollution, uh, I know there, there, there are places, um, especially in India, which get you know heavily polluted. So NCR is a classic example in 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 winter months, you know, because of this double burning and all that, there is a, a high degree of um, pollution um, uh, and particle suspension in the air, which is which is very threatening um, to human life. We will get all sorts of diseases, respiratory, um, even, even cancer. Uh, so those are the epigenetic uh, changes, um, most of them, if not all. And then if you change your lifestyle, if you change where you live, you go to a hill station, you settle there, um, you, you start doing yoga and exercise regularly, then, then you can even reverse um, that, that process. So here's an example of a veracite. I won't go into um, the detail because in just in the interest of time and assuming that most of you are not from um, uh, outside India. So, but yeah, this will get recorded and you can have a look. Um, it looks like a, a good business. They recently got merged with the Cypher Biosciences um, and look at the opportunity size uh, after the merger, right? It's, it's, it's close to 50 billion um, opportunity for them. And this is their new innovation where Nasal so I, I spoke about where they could do an early detection of cancer. They could classify it as a high risk, um, medium risk or low risk. And they plan to go live in the second half of this calendar year. And, and yeah, they, they have global reach there. It's a very relatively small company. I think three, $3 billion market cap or something. Um, so it looks interesting. Uh, so next up, we have um, CRISPR um, Cas9. Um, so I took this example from um, Editas, uh, which is again a, a CRISPR based um, innovator. Um, and here is an example where there is a vision uh, defect um, due to a protein CEP290 um, deficiency. Uh, and the way um, genome editing works is that it will either disrupt that gene. So the protein synthesis is di disrupted or it will delete that gene altogether or it will um, correct that gene. So the, the right protein synthesis takes place as, as shown in this example. Uh, and a single uh, dose um, editing removes the disease causing mutation and, and, and the patient is able to uh, see that again. So that's, that's the potential that um, CRISPR brings on table. Um, none of these therapies are approved, by the way. They are all in the clinical trials, but they've got a lot of promise. Uh, and people have been cured. Um, people have um, suffered and unfortunately collapsed as well as part of these 
uh, clinical trials. Uh, so gene um, gene uh, editing is is nothing new. It, it it has been ongoing for the last twenty years, and unfortunately, people uh, have lost lives in as part of the clinical trials. Sometimes it could be because of the the immune response itself or some incorrect editing leading to uh, cancer. So those scenarios have happened as um, as well. But it, it nevertheless, is a, is a, is a promising um, a new technology because otherwise, you know, there is no cure uh, for that um, uh, programming error or the syntax error in your um, in your in your genome. So here is an example of Victoria Gray. Um, she was suffering from sickle cell, which is a hemoglobin protein deficiency, and in that, so I mentioned that there is a every word is a three letter word right so in in the in the hemoglobin protein of chromosome 11 imagine a t in place of a uh, which is causing that error so it shouldn't be t it shouldn't be it should be an a it shouldn't be thymine it should be uh, it should be adenine and that small spelling mistake is causing you know such a big issue, uh, which is called sickle cell, because you know a, a, a normal RBC is a disc-shaped um, um, cell, but a sickle cell is like a sort of a, a, a semicircular blade. And the deficiency is that the protein uh, will not uh, be transporting oxygen the way it should, um, because of the shape. You know they may get stuck in the arteries; and it causes pain. And most patients, they, they don't uh, live a healthy long life. Uh, and, but this, fortunately, this lady was cured. The clinical trials were led by CRISPR uh, therapeutics. So yes, there is, there is there's a lot of hope and potential for happiness for many of these rare diseases where currently there is no treatment or, or cure because these chemical drugs, they, they cannot treat them. And in many cases, even the biologics um, uh, are unable to um, cure these. So cystic fibrosis is another such example. And there are many of those. Uh, so let's try and understand what gene editing is in simple terms. So this is just, um, as the name suggests, um, either you disrupt a, 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 a gene which is um, causing a, a programming or a syntax error, you delete that gene. Or, or, you, or, you, or you correct it, um, a, as simple as that. And, and here is a representation. So CRISPR is like a molecular scissor. Uh, it will disrupt um, your, uh, a part of your DNA and then the natural process within the cell itself would kick in and it will um, bind the, the DNA back but in the process, a um, couple of um, nucleotides will be lost. And then that's how you have disrupted um, uh, the the gene itself and you know whatever was causing um, uh, the synthesis of bad protein or the disease you have disrupted that mechanism so uh, potentially that that should lead to uh, the cure or in other cases you could have a, a you could you could engineer this and scientists can do that in, in the in the labs um, and you could swap that um, part of a section of um, the the DNA or the gene into the genome and then you can fix the error as well. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a biochemical tool. Um, so uh, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. That's a mouthful of words. And that's the reason CRISPR is a, is a nice acronym. Um, it's a very catchy as well. Um, so uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is nothing but a defense mechanism. So like, so viruses, they, don't just attack us. So coronavirus is one, but viruses, they attack all the living organisms, uh, plants, as well as the single cell. So in this case, imagine uh, a bacteriophages, which is the name uh, of the virus uh, attacking the bacteria. And the rivalry between viruses and bacteria, it, it's an ancient one. Millions and potentially billions of years um, uh, it dates back to. And as part of the evolution, um, um, the, the bacteria as a defense mechanism, they, they have um, created this sort of a, a debug section, so to speak, in their genome, which is, which is what CRISPR is all about. So if, if I look at the, the last three words, which is short um, um, palindromic repeats, um, so short means the sequence is about 20 to 40 um, base pair long. Um, palindromic is those 20 to 40 base pair 
read the same uh, backward and forward. So these are the, these navy blue or black um, colored spaces. So these are all palindromic in the sense that they read same backward and forward. So a word like a civic um, or a level, um, mom, wow, you could read the same backward and forward. So that that's what these um, sequences are, 20 to 40 uh, um, um, base pair long. So they are short, they are palindromic and they repeat, right? So you have the, the same sequence repeating over and over again. So that's what it means um, as part of the SPR within the, the CRISPR. And Oops. And then we have um, the Cas9 um, and the guide RNA. So although CRISPR takes all the sort of uh, limelight and, uh, and, and, and all the, uh, the fame, uh, in simple terms, understand the analogy that CRISPR is the CEO of, a, of an organization that is doing very well. So the, all the credit goes to the CEO. They come on media, you know, they, they share all the uh, the, the, the congratulations and, and, and well done sort of um, uh, updates. But behind the scene, the actual work is, could be done by the senior management team or the scientists and, and other people in the organization. So that's exactly what the, the CRISPR associated proteins or Cas9 proteins do. CRISPR takes all the, uh, the, the limelight, but the real hard work is done by the Cas enzymes um, along with the guide RNA which is, which is a, a, programmable, a programmable piece um, um, that could go inside the genome and, and search for a matching um, a sequence. And it's, it's, not, it's not simple and straightforward. So imagine, imagine um, you are going across the Indian coastline from Gujarat all the way to West Bengal, and you're looking for a twig or a small piece of a specific wood. Um, and that's, that's how um, complicated it is um, because the, gu the guide RNA is 20 to 40 uh, um, base pair long. And it's looking for something very specific in, in, in a 6 billion um, sort of nucleotides, A, T, T, P, C. So that's, that's the level of uh, complications. So that's why I said it's like looking for a, a small piece of a specific wood across the Indian coastline from Gujarat all the way to West Bengal. And so again, so that kind of explains the complexity and why potentially at times things can and do go wrong, unfortunately, because, you know, um, the guide RNA, it's like a sat nav basically. So if you're driving your car, the, the sat nav will, will take you from point A to point B. So that's exactly what this guide RNA is doing. But the real editing would be done by the Cas9. So Cas9 does the editing work, but it relies on the guide RNA to take it to the specific point um, in that genome where either the cut has to be applied or the, the edit has to be applied. Uh, feel free to ask questions if you want uh, at the end of the presentation, um, but I think I have explained everything um, here in picture. So um, you, can, you, can, you can see this um, example. So the Cas9 is like a molecular scissor Scientists can create this guide RNA, then they, they go together um, in, in, in pairs. So, so like in case of bacteria and the virus, um, just to quickly explain, whenever the virus attacks a bacteria, what, what the bacteria does is it, it takes a snapshot of, the, uh, of the, the CRISPR or the, the debug section within its genome. And then and the guide RNA and Cas9, they get to work um, looking for that matching sequence in, in that bacteriophages or the virus that is attacking that bacteria. And if they find the match, they know that um, this is, um, this is uh, a virus um, and, and, and not only just any virus, but it's from the family that uh, they know because they have that genetic memory from uh, the surviving the past um, viral attacks. And the Cas9 will um, dismantle the genome of the virus, and and that's how the bacteria use that as a as a defense mechanism. Uh, but because it's an ancient rivalry between um, bacteria and and, and virus, but the virus have got uh, you know anti defense mechanism as well. So bacteria is trying to ward off the attack from the virus, and virus has got something called an anti CRISPR, which kind of um, attempts to um, 
break um, the CRISPR system within, within the CRISPR defense system that is within the bacteria. Um, so here is what uh, happens. The, the Cas9 and the guide RNA, they hunt in pairs. They look for a very specific sequence in the genome. When they find the match, and they will do the editing. Uh, and, and that's what it is. And typically, viral vectors um, are used to uh, transport um, the CRISPR-Cas9 into uh, the nucleus. And the, the reason these viral vectors, which are uh, typically the, the adeno-associated um, uh, vectors, and they are, they are safe viruses, so they won't harm um, the humans, and they are genetically engineered. Uh, and the reason scientists prefer um, the virus is they know how to get inside or penetrate the, the cell. And that's, that's their moat, right? So the scientists have kind of hacked the and the, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, and they use these viral vectors to um, um, transport um, the CRISPR-Cas9 complex into a specific point in the, in the genome to, to do that um, editing. And, and guide RNA could be done in-house or they, they do this uh, with um, the help of um, the CDMOs. Um, and, and that's how the, the find and cut or the find and replace um, editing takes place in, in, in simple terms. So um, coming to um, uh, precision um, uh, medicine. So um, again, as the name suggests, these are specific to an underlying um, a mutation um, or a genetic disorder. And close to 400 million children worldwide suffer from inherited um, diseases. Um, um, so um, the, the, the issue here is, and I've given some example here, uh, the EGFR gene um, as an example, or the ALK gene uh, rearrangement. The, the main issue with these precision medicines and the newest therapies is, is the affordability uh, and the accessibility, of course. And the, and the other um, issue is you know, the risk of um, unknown unknowns. And that's the reason these clinical trials go on for years uh, because the safety and efficacy both have to be uh, established. Uh, and none of these therapies um, today are approved, but there is hope that you know a lot of um, therapies will get uh, approved and the, the size of the healthcare uh, uh, industry as a whole will expand because these therapies, uh, assuming that you know, um, they go uh, and, and treat all of these underlying um, rare diseases, it could be you know, at least same as the current industry. So 1.5 trillion is the, is the global healthcare industry. The single um, gene mutation therapies um, fixes to those, the, the, the treatment alone could be in that one to two um, trillion sort of uh, ballpark uh, as per today's uh, estimates. So there is, there is potential for sure, uh, but I think, you know, we may be some distance away from uh, getting these um, therapies, the new therapies fully approved um, and um, at a price point where it's affordable and it could impact the masses because the majority of the, the population is in tropical countries and is emerging uh, markets where people will not be able to afford uh, the current pricing because if it takes 1 million um, ballpark to cure a disease, then majority of the world population will not be able to afford them. Uh, so coming to immunotherapy, so uh, before becoming deadly, a cancer cell starts life um, just like any other normal cell. And it goes through a successive mutation, um, successive um, uh, split. So whenever a cell divides, it copies the entire um, um, instruction manual or the genome and, and, a, and a normal, typical human body will have 37 um, trillion cells, uh, roughly speaking. So a cancer cell starts as a, as a normal cell, but then as, as the mutations build and the factors could be anything from radiations to lifestyle, uh, the mutations start sort of a snowball. And then at, at some point in time, the, the cancer um, may become um, really rampant and it starts growing you know, uh, disproportionately and usually is detected at a, at a very late stage, um, right? So the way immunotherapy works is a sort of a using a proxy war um, as an analogy here. So inside our body, there are, there are 
there are good there's a good guy and there's a bad guy um, let's say a cancer cell and the good guy are your immune uh, system um, cells so your t cells and b cells and your b cell is like your khabri is the informer they so what happens is that in 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 animal cells there is just like we have got fingerprints right they have um, a, a a protein which is on the outer membrane and that helps the the other cell identify them but cancer cells they they are they are notorious they don't play fair what they will do is they will hide their protein identity so that t cells are unable to identify them they also um, do other things like um, they will um, generate certain molecules that will put the t t cells to sleep uh, but b cells are good in identifying those um, cancer cells but they are not fighter cells they cannot fight so the the way immunotherapy works is that it we help the good guy so we help the good enemy um, good good army we engineer this t cell um, genetically engineer it uh, so that it gets the power of the the b cell um, uh, the the sense uh, and um, just one thing before we prog uh, progress so there's there's something called receptor right so on in simple terms um just to put it in a very simple um, uh, sort of analogy imagine um there is a submarine and there is a periscope right and which kind of looks uh, helps uh, to detect you know what's going around um, uh, outside uh, uh, over the surface right that's exactly the purpose of the receptor it's like a door where the cell keeps track of you know what's what's going around whether the the gate has to be opened um, or not open but the cancer cell disguises um, brilliantly and then it kind of fools the uh, the cell and it penetrates into the cell then it hijacks the the machinery and it starts replicating and that's how it becomes you know um, cancerous cells so the, the the way the mechanism of immunotherapy works is uh, you make super t cells by genetically um, engineering those cells and and then um, we will see um, Uh, in in car t therapy uh, as as an example that you know this super t cell will go inside uh, once they are genetically modified uh, they will uh, have the power of the b cell to identify those cancer cells because now they cannot um, hide from these uh, super killer t cells and they will destroy those cancer cells so that's in a sense is your own body's immune system uh, fighting uh, the deadly disease uh, which um, chemotherapy unfortunately uh, fails uh, to deal and that's that's the reason by the way why we have got biologic drugs because they are much more um, precision targets so biologic is like a heat guided missile which will target a specific um, area and not bombard the entire residential area so to speak whereas chemotherapy is like your ak47 which will fire um, indiscriminately and in the process it will also cause damage to um, uh, the good tissues or the cells as well uh, so coming on to the the cell and gene and therapy and car t so i have tweeted this many times i thought i'll include a slide to help you guys better understand what it means so the underlying objective of cell therapy gene therapy and car t therapy is very similar they want to um, make certain changes in our um, genetic structure but the way or the pathway they take to do this is slightly different so in cell therapy we'll introduce new healthy cell into the patient um, um, to um, take care of the disease cells and there are two variants is um, uh, autologous where uh, they are originating from uh, the healthy cells are originating from the patient themselves or allogenic where you've got a donor uh, and then the cells are cultivated or modified or multiplied outside the the body um, ex vivo and then injected back into the patient so this is a small picture from uh, intellia therapeutics another interesting um, pattern play on the crispr um, technologies explaining um, you know uh, both the the ex vivo and the in vivo side where ex vivo is where crispr creates the therapy and in vivo is where crispr itself is the is is the therapy uh, and then gene therapy is is very similar as well so the it aims to treat the diseases by fixing uh, the incorrect um, genes so typically you would use the same viral vector example where um, uh, adeno associated uh, virus or an um, aav uh, will take um, the 
the genetically modified um, gene inside uh, the body. So there will be an injection and um, that um, genetically modified viral vector will take that um, required gene um, inside and then, you know, they, and, and millions of them. So they are grown with so viruses um, genetically modified then those type of cells um, are um, genetically um, um, changed. The genome structure is changed. The cells are multiplied and then um, back to the human body where they fight it out and, and they cure. So that's, that's in principle the, the way the CAR-T um, works. So CAR-T is a, is a combination of cell and gene therapy, so to speak. Uh, and scientists expect that gene therapy will eventually treat or cure majority of genetic and rare diseases. US FDA currently getting 200 applications for these gene therapies annually. So there are lots and lots of trials going on uh, and hopefully we'll get lots and lots of approved therapies uh, and hopefully at an affordable uh, price uh, so that majority of the world population um, could afford them. There is a graphic representation of um, how this whole um, CAR-T therapy works uh, in principle. And that's here where is the uh, the the T cell is is genetically modified using that virus. So virus is carrying that um, uh, gene inside the T cell, and then that's how you transform them into super T cells. You grow them, and you put them back into the patient body to uh, sort of help the immune system uh, fight um, fight the uh, the bad guy or or the or the cancer cells. Uh, so yeah, cost is definitely uh, very high and there are some um, risk of unknown because uh, like any new therapy, you know, uh, you do uh, clinical trials and then even after those clinical trials, if you get the, the final approval um, a year or two down the, the line when you are addressing a wider population, um, some complexities um, may potentially emerge and you know, sometimes you do a rollback, you, you again start, you know, an extended clinical trial. So those kind of challenges are part and parcel of the, the healthcare industry. <clears throat> Coming to the affordability and accessibility. So Carl June, guys, is an Im immunologist, is an oncologist based in the US and, and he's conscious of the fact that these therapies uh, are priced uh, exorbitantly high. So, I mean, a million plus for a therapy is simply unaffordable. And here is talking about the immunil, uh, which is the, the venture uh, where uh, Biocons in Gene and uh, 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 Narana Health and Dr. Devi Shetty, um, along with the oncologist, um, uh, uh, the guy Mukherjee, can't remember, it's Siddharth Mukherjee, so they have they have um, they've come together and they've floated this um, CAR T therapy based enterprise in India, and their objective is to make the treatment affordable um, uh, to, to so bring it down from a million to fifty thousand. Now again, for a country like India, even USD fifty thousand is expensive, but it's it's way better than having a therapy which is only at one million. It's completely priced out of anyone um, or most of a majority of the Indian. Um, people, but having USD 50,000, there is a still a chance that, you know, um, people would be able to afford it. And, and as Moore's law uh, happens with any technology over a period of time, over the next five, 10 years, the therapy will become much more affordable and hopefully, you know, more and more people will get um, benefited. So um, coming to some of the, the challenges um, in CRISPR and gene editing, uh, let's take them bit by bit. So precisely targeting CRISPR-Cas9 to the parts of the body is still challenging. Uh, so that's, that's one area where many clinical trials are focused on. Uh, the issue is to get uh, CRISPR only to the cells of interest um, and not, uh, not do any sort of um, wrong editing uh, because and then also ensuring that enough editing is taking place um, to get the, the desired benefits. The, the, the big risk is, um, so if you are from IT industry, you can use the analogy of regression testing, some of you would understand. So it's nothing but you're trying to fix a defect and you have created another one or potentially two more. So that's what um, the challenge is uh, that, you know, what if gene editing goes wrong? Uh, 
Uh, what if there are undesired effects? You know, the, so the expression of Cas9 is happening in wrong place or for too long. Um, and that could have, you know, some serious um, impact on the genome and the, and the, and the gene expression. Um, so some, someone could be free from cancer and as part of gene editing uh, to cure their uh, blindness, um, uh, cancer was um, caused as part of a wrong um, um, editing as an example. Um, so we need, we need a proven ability uh, to precision target uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 to a specific area. And again, understand the complexity, 6 billion of these nucleotides and looking for a very small area where um, guide RNA has to be really precision perfect to take the Cas9 to that specific area within your genome and apply that um, edit. Um, so yes, the, the, there are significant risks um, as well. And there is something called an anti-CRISPR protein, uh, which um, could act as an off switch because, you know, once you have supplied CRISPR-Cas9 into the human body, it's living there forever. And it may get activated at some point again in future and do an unwanted editing. So you don't want that, right? So you um, scientists are working on an off switch um, where um, they can toggle. Uh, so they could use um, the, the opto uh, or the light um, as, as a potential source to turn uh, the uh, anti-CRISPR on and off. Um, there are other um, clinical trials which are focusing on a um, specific unique RNA. So the way it's programmed is that if a certain RNA is found um, in, in a liver, um, for example, then the anti-CRISPR will not function there to allow um, the CRISPR-Cas9 to apply the editing. But otherwise, if that unique RNA is missing, then anti-CRISPR will always be on uh, so that, you know, the unwanted editing doesn't happen. And then, of course, there are other um, uh, risks as well. So unethical or terrorism. So bioterrorism, now that you know the genome can be edited, you could edit a genome uh, of an animal um, or a microorganism, and, and you could use that uh, as, a, as a source of biological weapon. Uh, against the against the mankind there is also an ethical angle as well so imagine in the germline editing uh, for example if a certain um, gene is edited um, in in the G, in the in the germline um, then not only that person will get edited their future generations would also be edited uh, so there was something that happened in china the crispr babies in 2018 you know so there's a if you just Google the, the CRISPR babies, China 2018, you would find that. So in most countries today, the germline editing uh, is prohibited, it's not allowed because there is a fine line between a disease and an enhancement. So, so if, if you allow that, I mean, tomorrow people will say, I want you know my skin color to look like this. I want my height to be such and such. And this whole concept of empathy, uh, you know, a, a ovarian lottery, as Warren Buffett um, calls it many times, would just disappear because then everyone will be um, uh, picture perfect, assuming that it becomes affordable. So I think there is a there is a serious ethical angle there, but the the line has to be drawn where what is a disease, and you know, if there is no other therapy available to cure that. And CRISPR-Cas9 has been all proven, approved in clinical trials. Then, arguably, yes, um, there is a there is a there is a genuine case for that uh, patient to be cured, um, like the case of uh, Victoria Gray in the in the sickle cell case, because otherwise there is no no cure or therapy for sickle cell. Um, and of course, the regulatory pathways are still emerging and uncertain. Um, and imagine how long it took uh, the biologics or biosimilars regulatory pathway to be cleared in the US, right? Uh, so imagine, you know, how long it will take for various CRISPR-based um, gene editing therapies to be completing the clinical trials and, and then getting all the final approval. So yeah, th there are certain risks as well, but I think on balance, this is a step in the right direction. Um, there are many people suffering because of these rare diseases and there has to be a cure uh, for those diseases, uh, right? So um, coming um, to uh, bioprinting, uh, another important area. 
Uh, so currently there is a massive shortage of donor organs. So more than 100,000 people are waiting in the US and the, the, the promise of the potential of bioprinting is that it's an extension of 3D printing where it can repair or replace um, tissues. Uh, but the, the, the significant challenge, so bioprinting is not new. It first emerged about five, six um, years back, uh, but it hasn't um, gained a significant traction since because there are challenges. There are challenges in printing complex body parts like liver and kidney, for example. And then uh, if, it's a, if it's a large organ keeping the blood supply, um, otherwise the cells would start dying. So there are, there are some serious logistical uh, and clinical challenges. But nevertheless, a lot of research is happening. Uh, so just to get some um, um, syntax out of the way. So bioink is anything which is the cell or material used in bioprinting. Uh, bioprint cell is the material that actually make up those um, human tissues. Um, and, and then potentially, you know, it can reduce the need for um, uh, animal testing because then you can have, you know, a, a bioengineered sort of organ and you could directly undertake your clinical trials there rather than doing those preclinical studies in the mice models as an example. But we are still, you know, um, away from having a, a universal sort of access. Every drug is being um, treated on bio um, and printed um, stuff. I think we are still um, some distance away from that. So. I don't see these mice models to be disappearing anytime soon, uh, to be perfectly honest. And then again, fully functional organs um, available for transplant may, may well be a distant dream. And the reason is that is the complexity of these organs itself. So there's a picture here um, uh, I got from a um, scientist is a so the bone, so anything which is green is, is where um, the, the bioprinting has had some initial success. Um, and then anything which is sort of um, yellowish is where um, there are still sort of some serious uh, clinical trials and challenges uh, that are foreseen. And anything other than that, so brain is a classic example, uh, is unlikely to be a bioprinted brain. Um, at least um, over the next several decades, if not forever, because it's just the complexity of the organ itself. Um, so any, any organ which is massively complex, um, there is not even a clinical trial at the moment on those, um, but some attempts has been, have been made to you know, do a bioprinted liver, for an example, or, or a heart, or, or again, but very, very limited success. Um, um, and Bay Forest Institute of uh, Regenerative Medicine, they have been bioprinting the uh, skin, muscles, et cetera, but purely for animal testing. Um, and here are some bioengineers and comments from the scientists as well. And they acknowledge um, that, you know, there are serious challenges in terms of the complexity of these tissues and keeping the oxygen uh, supply flowing um, as well. So yeah, uh, the, the challenge is um, galore. I mean, uh, the tissues and organs are made of a variety of uh, different cell types. Um, blood supply is, is a definite challenge. Immune rejection, so these are foreign sources. When you introduce you know, a foreign source, uh, the body starts reacting um, and there is an immune uh, response. And sometimes the immune response goes into an overdrive, right? And this is what has happened in, in some of the, the the unfortunate incidents leading to uh, many patients dying because of coronavirus, because of their immune system going on uh, in on overdrive because of those the cytokine storm. Uh, so that risk is there in in, in bioprinting as well. A regulatory risk against new technology, um, high risk technology. So regulatory pathway again is is not proven. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges there. Data protection legislation, another um, key challenge because you know sensitive patient data uh, needs to be shared because it's a very distributed supply chain, which also adds to the complexity uh, because you know the various components um, in the bioprinted organ. Uh, so the supply chain is a big challenge. Um, the there is no single source you know a large factory where you could print them so you know there are smaller units inside these hospitals uh, or labs where you know you just need to print something and test it because you cannot you cannot make these um, in an offshore destination like india and, and transport right it's not going to happen 
um, and then accessibility and affordability last but not the least i mean this something like this cannot be um, uh, you know priced um, at a, at a price point where it's affordable for the masses. So like any of these new therapies, the affordability and accessibility is, is a key challenge. And that's what some of, you know, companies like Biocon, et cetera, their whole objective is to make drugs affordable and accessible, uh, right from insulin to, um, to other maps uh, as an example. But across the board, you know, the new therapies are all fine, they're welcome. But if um, emerging markets and tropical countries, um, poorer countries are, um, you know, they're not able to afford them, there's, there's not much benefit from, from a volume perspective. Uh, <clears throat> so as a case study of a, of a company called um, Selling, um, I thought I'll just study this, um, but I found that, you know, it's a very thinly traded stock with just 3000 shareholders. Um, uh, so it's very easy to sort of manipulate the price, um, I suppose, because the holdings are concentrated in very few shareholders. Uh, worth tracking this business for sure from technology updates, um, but not something that my investing framework would allow me because I see uh, the risk reward is not in my favor. The stock could go 100x from here, I don't know, but I would rather look at something which I could understand better where the, the, the risk reward is in my favor. Um, and, and lastly, I think the CRISPR can resolve the shortage of donor organs as well. So this is, this is a fantastic um, potential that the CRISPR has. So what CRISPR can do is uh, it can help custom manufacture uh, an individual's organ um, inside a pig, uh, so acting as a surrogate mother, uh, so to speak, where the stem cells are genetically engineered uh, and then CRISPR disables the, 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 the original genes inside the pig. So instead of producing um, the, the traditional or conventional organs that the pigs would when they grow up, they will um, uh, act as a factory for um, producing the, the organs of uh, eye specific individual. Um, so this is another potential area where a lot of research is currently uh, progressing. And if this, this happens, then probably bioprinting as, as, as the only way forward for um, uh, organ donation problem resolution uh, may not hold water. So also from that perspective, I'm not sure whether the valuations of 30 times, 50 times price to sales um, is justified. Um, call me Mr. Conservative, if you will. Uh, bioprinting though has some um, other um, potential um, um, business uses. So uh, in, in cell culture and meat production, as an example, uh, we are already seeing some um, bioprinting um, in action uh, as, as this picture uh, details. Right, so uh, moving into um, the agri biotechnology, time-wise, I think we are doing fine. So again, CRISPR offers a lot of um, hope for uh, the agri biotechnology. Now, most of you would think that, you know, biotechnology in agri space is a very old science, at least two, three decades. And there's a lot of um, GMO work that has been done. Uh, almost um, every staple crop is, is GMO uh, genetically modified uh, these days. But gene editing using CRISPR and CRISPR-based technologies is completely different from GMO. And I'll explain that um, as we go along. But the whole point or the benefit of having CRISPR in agriculture um, or agri sciences is to suppress unfavorable characteristics like you know, disease vulnerability, as an example, or empower uh, the beneficial characteristics like making the plant or the crops um, drought resist, um, resistant or, or tolerant, at least. Also breaking the genetic linkages between genes conferring uh, positive traits uh, with less desirable traits like drought sensitivity, as an example. Um, so it, it has a lot of potential um, in, in agri-sciences. Um, uh, 90% of major global crops like corn and soya bean are, are genetically um, engineered. Um, there's a lot of CRISPR based research that is currently going on. 
uh, on potatoes and being a top um, global crop. Uh, so potato crops are always under attack from uh, bacteria, viruses and, uh, and fungus, right? But CRISPR can make these potatoes blight resistant by knocking a few genes out of uh, potatoes genome. Uh, so, um, successful, um, secondly, successful gene editing can also limit or even eliminate <clears throat> the use of some of the, the harmful um, chemical pesticides. Uh, so, one example here is how CRISPR could help um, address the problem of cold-induced sweeting, which is nothing but um, uh, starch converting uh, into sugar um, as part of the storage. <coughs> and then... Uh, during uh, high temperature cooking, um, the, the sugar gets converted to acrylamide, uh, acrylamide right? And acrylamide is uh, detrimental for our central nervous system. And in some cases, it can even cause cancer. Uh, so what CRISPR-Cas9 could do is knock out the single gene that converts the starch into sugar. Uh, and then that problem of cold-induced sweeting um, won't happen. And likewise, Solanine is, um, is, is a good example. Um, uh, it, can, it can knock out um, that um, and then that will save a lot of crop from going waste because, you know, the, the potatoes, when they start turning green or they're, they're greenish, uh, we discard them. And, 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 and solanine is, is, is the reason for that. But if CRISPR could act on uh, certain genes by editing them out, then you know we could increase the produce or the productivity of um, the potato crop as well so that's another potential um, area of um, uh, benefit a lot of companies are doing research we have got two examples um, coming up here one um, is an indian company surprise surprise uh, one is um, a, a company here in the uk um, that i look forward to um, as and when the ipo comes so i think it could be a promising story uh, and also CRISPR can also make vegetables more nutritious um, by just um, adding in or editing in certain sort of uh, traits or genes uh, in the potato genome. So there are lots and lots of um, opportunities that will unfold going forward. Um, thanks to the CRISPR, uh, we'll also see the difference between the, the GMO and the gene editing. So Japan as a country, they have approved gene editing. Um, North America as, as well, they're saying that gene edited, gene edited crops that don't contain a foreign DNA. So if there is a foreign DNA, it's a GMO. Whereas in gene editing, there is no foreign DNA. That's the key difference. Gene editing uses the, the genes of the same family. Whereas in GMO, uh, you, you can pretty much do anything. So I've done a, a comparison of the table here. So the DNA origin is from the same family within CRISPR gene editing um, area. Whereas in GMOs, the genes from other species um, come into play. Uh, the DNA location is, is a very precise location in, in gene editing, whereas um, in GMO, it's random locations within the, ge within the genome. Uh, so it's much more restricted gene editing and it's part of the same family. Those, those are the key differences. And then, uh, identification, so modified plants are identical to their traditional equivalent. So this is like the breeding that our ancestors have been doing in agri-science. So the gene editing is nothing but a more science-based approach to that breeding. GMO is, is, is different. So modified plants are different from those um, traditional um, plants uh, in GMOs. But gene editing is like the conventional breeding uh, that our ancestors uh, and forefathers have been doing. Um, or what Mendel uh, um, was was um, was doing, you know, we know um, just Google Mendel and and biotechnology or gene editing, and there's a lot of literature I'm sure you would find on on Google. And again, finally, on the regulation, so European Union um, uh, is is one which is taking a very um, hyper conservative stance, and you know they are. Um, prohibiting or restricting any gene edit, uh, edited crops. France is uh, challenging it, uh, but I think Europe is a, is a, is a way behind uh, Japan, North America. I'm sure uh, it's worth in, it would be interesting to see what Singapore and Israel, because these are much more progressive countries. Um, they, I am sure, would be uh, approving gene um, editing because I know um, cell culture meat is approved in 
both these countries in Israel and in Singapore. So these are, you know, more progressive uh, countries that are going by the science rather than um, taking a much more conservative stance of the European Union. Uh, but that's, that's where we are uh, in terms of gene editing uh, and GMOs. Uh, and here is a, a case study of this company. So this is the British company I was uh, talking about. So their, their premise is very simple. They're saying that by 2030, tropical nations will have 500 million additional people. 50% of global population will be in tropical countries. And if they could use the, the CRISPR um, technology to um, improve uh, the produce and, and make them um, disease resistant, uh, it would be a massive improvement on the the productivity. Um, so they have come up with a proprietary technology called gene editing induced and gene silencing. Uh, and before we understand that, let's have a quick refresh of the DNA, RNA, and uh, RNA interference or RNAi. So DNA, as we know, is the blueprint where all the genetic instructions are coded. RNA transcribes it, uh, gets out of the bunker called nucleus, and you know. Um, um, uh, does the orchestration or an oversight of the protein synthesis. Then there is another phenomenon called RNA interference, which is, which is as the name suggests, it, it inhibits the synthesis of the protein. So it, 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 it disturbs the, 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 uh, the RNA. Uh, there's, a, there's an enzyme called Dicer enzyme. Um, you can Google that. Um, and RNA interference is a natural occurring phenomena, which it kind of stops the, uh, the natural um, um, orchestration of messenger RNA that participates in the, in the protein synthesis. So this company, um, Tropic Biosciences, are leveraging this um, core science of um, RNA interference to silence um, um, some of the, the genes of the insects, um, and the, the, the funguses and the viruses, um, and um, try and make these banana crops resistant to Panama disease. Uh, and the picture on the right is just explaining how uh, they go about it. And not only on the banana, they, they plan to um, do this on some of the other um, major um, tropical region crops like coffee uh, as, as, as one and some of the other, like rice is another good example of that. And there is an, another potential. So the reason I'm interested in this company is that, you know, because it's a technology play, there is a potential for out licensing. So this should, in theory, um, the numbers are, are not uh, widely uh, available, but in theory, this should be a high ROE, ROC business, no asset turns because it's all technology um, uh, play. Where once you have got a, a patented technology, you could like, uh, out license um, that the same and you could get the royalty income. Um, so fundamentally speaking, I think this looks like an interesting um, uh, opportunity as and when we get to the IPO stage. And that's the reason I included that. Uh, there's a description of, you know, how the, the global landscape um, looks and, you know, the role that the, the agriculture biologics um, uh, could play here in terms of the biofertilizers, the biostimulants, uh, the biopesticides, um, uh, the fungicides and insecticides, etc. And Biopesticides have got certain advantages and disadvantages over um, chemical uh, fertilizers, so to speak. So I've just listed them out here. I'm not going to um, go through them line by line. But one key difference is the time of action. So um, biopesticides um, take longer uh, to kick um, into action, whereas the chemical uh, ones are rapid action, but they are, they are also polluting, they contain toxic inputs, they are synthetic, whereas bio um, uh, pesticides are more natural. Um, so I think the world is slowly moving towards um, biopesticides and I, and I do expect many uh, governments, uh, more and more governments across the world will um, uh, uh, sort of um, um, come out with policy framework to um, uh, help farmers and, and community adopt uh, the biopesticides over the, the chemical pesticides because bioeconomy, as we saw, it's all about sustainability. And these chemical um, pesticides and fertilizers, they are not sustainable. Uh, we know that they are not sustainable. So 
you know it's it's a it's a long journey but i think it's an irreversible process um, ultimately you know most um, of these um, pesticides will get uh, replaced from chemical to bio it it won't happen um, overnight it won't happen uh, within the year but i think the longer term directional trend is um, moving in that direction so here is this indian company uh, it's a small cap um, relative to the opportunity size and i think they have been doing many things in the background without making any noise or fuss about it um, they hardly come on media they hardly speak about their their plans they are keeping it all under the uh, the carpet they are working very uh, quietly on many things actually so rallies acquired um, a company called meta helix a bioscience company way back in 2010 and they got lot of ip and technology as part of that um, uh, acquisition and they have been using cutting edge technology to further develop uh, on the back of those patents um, and and the the innovation suite that they got from meta helix and so they have been working on um, gene editing um, they have been working on plant growth nutrients like biologicals and biostimulants and micronutrients and they are almost halfway through uh, a mammoth capex uh, about 800 crores which includes a setting up of a new r&d facility worth close to about 90 or 100 crores in bangalore so that would be the second or the third r&d center rather so they have got this rich which was always the relis um, innovation center and then meta helix has got one um, r&d currently and they they spend decent amount in the r&d uh, bioscience r&d already but now they are coming up with this third uh, much larger and modern um, r&d campus and just been looking through their annual reports and management interviews i found that yes they are doing some work on gene editing uh, and functional genomics they don't talk much about it because um, for maybe competitive reasons or or they they just um, waiting for the right set of policy framework um, um, in india to be announced um, but yeah you can see that they have been investing you know decent amount of money over the years ever since the acquisition uh, on the bioscience r&d uh, and they have actually started launching um, some um, bio based uh, products so this is one example um, um, m plus uh, uh, if you read their third quarter not the latest uh, presentation the third quarter presentation q3 of 521 they have mentioned the two new launches and their um, Uh, and and again uh, lock cost is one area where you know these insects they they disrupt um, almost on a uh, on an annualized basis across the globe not just in india and there is some research which suggests that bio pesticides if used consistently they can permanently resolve this uh, problem uh, of uh, lock cost um, hitting us damaging our crops and they cause all sorts of um, a nuisance uh Ishmoit, I think we can take that five-minute break um, before we I jump think. onto the human, uh, so that everyone is fresh. The, our uh, stretch our legs for quick five minutes, but we'll keep it to five minutes, right? Right thing. I think we should. We should. I think for five minutes, uh, we'll just take a break. Yeah. And Sarthak, okay. we can also float the Google form for any questions that anyone has, and uh, we'll take those questions at the end. Uh, so Sarthak, you can float the Google form. Sure. 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 So I'll I'll be back in five minutes, guys. Right? Right. We're just taking a five. We're just taking a five minutes break, everyone. Sure. Sure. What would you reckon? I think yes. Yeah, so we should start. Okay. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So um, welcome back, guys. Um, we've got plenty of ground to cover. So um, in the next area or section within the the whole um, universe of biosciences, we are on to. Uh, human and animal biotechnology uh, including vaccines um, which is um, has grabbed so much um, limelight and attention um, for various reasons and we we'll look at bioinformatics which is mainly in the area of cdmo cram so xaas is anything which is uh, a... sir uh, so just a second just before we start i think the microphone is again touching with the zip and it's creating some distortion right okay sure yeah thanks for that yeah 
sorry a little, little more careful yeah thanks for that <laughs> no worries, really no worries. Yeah. so um a platform as a service so x could be a drug discovery service uh, it could be drug development service or drug manufacturing service um so that's one in area that we would um, touch upon um, there's a lot of um, uh, activity happening uh, both within and outside vaccines in this space um <clears throat> So just to uh, see, you know, abroad. So this is just a, a broad representation. Um, um, majority of companies are what I, I I like about. I some of them I have um, investment. Some of them I have spoken multiple times, um, and some of them are very small uh, in size. So something like a Rich Core, which is uh, very small in size, uh, Med Genome. Again, it's a it's a private uh, entity in India. Um, maybe an exciting ipo opportunity intas is another one which is not listed uh, you know i look forward to their um, red herring prospectus as and when they decide to come out um, with an ipo and likewise for um, hetero biopharma i think um, many indian companies by the way um, have been trying um, to get into the us market with these biologics but so far biocon is the only player but i think there are some um, potentials in there so i've highlighted uh, lupin and zydas um, i'll speak more about them in a second and then inters and and hetero biopharma and there are many others but i think uh, not every um, business to the best of my understanding is geared up um, to get into the highest um, regulated markets uh, but these are uh, some of the unlisted ones where um, i think i'd be interested the reason i um, circled um, zydas and lupin so they are great enterprises but somehow i believe that massive value unlocking can happen if they demerge their biologics um, uh, division something like what strides is planning to do with stellis which is its biosciences uh, division so if if zydas and lupin could um, you know have some sort of a spin off or 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 demerger um, go for an ipo or or do some value unlocking then i think these these enterprises are sitting on a, a very high um, uh, ip uh, business um, and they have been investing in bioscience research for for many years um, actually and they have some uh, interesting um, pipeline as well but because it's part of the larger enterprise so in case of zydas they do vaccines they do uh, even animal health care which again is a very small component so perhaps uh, you know they should spin that off as well um, and they have got biologics and they have got complex um, injectables um, so it's it's a, it's a it's a great enterprise but i think from a shareholder perspective if um, uh, a, a large shareholder could convince them to demerge i think that that should potentially unlock some um, some more value interestingly zydas is ahead of lupin and sun pharma as, as far as the the share price is concerned because if you see sun pharma and lupin they are still below their 2015 peak way below actually whereas zydas is actually um, already at the at the lifetime high and they have got vaccine play as well um so i hope you know uh, there is some uh, further uh, values they have been in news for remdesivir as well uh, and and lupin again is a very interesting uh, life sciences company they have come a long way in the last 20 years by the way it, it used to be uh, you know a very um, perception was that lupin is a bad business and i'm talking about late 90s and 2000 um, um, late um, dr desh bandhu gupta used to be the uh, at the helm and um, it it was a very small company if i remember correctly it was 150 200 crore market cap company in those days and it never looked back um, if even today it's about 50% down from um, its um, 2015 peak but even even at the current market price if someone has held lupin for 20 years what they invested 20 years back is is nothing in relation to the dividends the annual dividends that they are getting today forget about the share price that's a multi bagger anyway so even in this uh, depressed um, share price environment uh, lupin has rewarded shareholders over a period of 20 years but yeah it hasn't rewarded um, for um, those who joined uh, the bandwagon in 2014 or 15 and lot of large caps have um, 
have disappointed and and lupin and sun pharma unfortunately are 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 two such um, and again um, so it is is another example um, so previously in the current animal healthcare space there is there is no uh, biologics play right but zoetis and some of the other like boinger is another one they are coming out with um, maps monoclonal antibodies and and i think that will a significantly enhance the overall animal healthcare market and offer you know an alternative treatment and a better treatment um, to the pet parents because there are people who are willing to uh, pay um, uh, to get their um, cats and dogs and horses treated um and zoetis has got interesting uh, monoclonal antibodies in the pipeline um, and i think there is there is there is a reason to be um, excited about uh, the future uh, of biologics in the animal healthcare as well and then we have got some uh, cdmos like lonza syngene um, the thermo fisher pathian um, so there is lot of interesting um, space happening we have um, a small uh, sort of will um, drill deeper into rich core and and stellis as we go along uh, and some of the other vaccine opportunities that are there in india but overall i think the space looks um, extremely positive because what these companies can do um, from in the biologics space is not what a, a typical generic um, chemical pharma company can because it's a completely different science altogether Uh, so um, shape of things um, to come um, so small molecules have still got uh, a place and, and they will continue um, to have a place but i think uh, the the real uh, disruptive therapies and, and new sciences are coming out of um, the adcs the bio specific antibodies and um, and many uh, companies that uh, that we just and demonstrate on the dashboard are working on 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 these um uh future therapies so uh, monoclonal antibodies is one example um so like natural antibodies they are potent and highly selective so it's like a a, a heat seeking or a guided missile unlike chemotherapy which is a more you know ak47 type approach i'll kill everything that comes my way uh, i cannot uh differentiate between a good cell and a bad cell or a cancer cell so unlike chemotherapy or the chemical drugs um and uh, the monoclonal antibodies are uh, potent and highly selective uh, but i have not seen many people um, especially in india uh, talk positively about about this space uh, i am personally very excited um, i've invested in biocon for for many years now uh but i i i i am very excited about the uh, the space purely because these are much more targeted therapies and and secondly as i've highlighted the mavs tend to stay in the body longer than other medicines so in general they are dosed less frequently and some of the examples of um, the companies but this is not by no means a comprehensive list there are many many companies uh, that are working on uh, monoclonal antibodies um uh uh so it is is another example it's not uh, here but they have um, started rolling out um, maps for animals um, healthcare as well then adcs is another uh, promising area so the goal of an adc is to deliver a a, a cytotoxic payload more directly uh, to the to the tumor cell uh, and and reduce the collateral damage uh, to the healthy tissue so again these drugs are massively superior than than the traditional um, chemical uh, drugs that's an old science uh, if i am completely honest and um, this is the this is where uh, the the new science is, is is already progressing and recently um, i think dishman kabujan got uh, one of the adcs approved uh, again i have been um, vocal about dishman kabujan um, multiple times and they have been set backs um, in the past and uh, 2019 was one uh, example but i think now after the edqm um, censure um, and regulatory scrutiny and disruption they they have fired so many people and they have hired some fresh talent 
and perhaps you know if you look at the the website has been completely transformed um, they are announced they have announced a new fresh capex as well so maybe early signs that you know they are determined to get their acts together um, proof of pudding is in eating we have to wait for a few years and see uh, but again at, at one point in time solara uh, was quoting at 150 and you know no one looked at that business it was uh, sequent was at 40, 45 bucks and no one was interested in that business either. So, I mean, uh, rear view mirror um, driving is, is very easy, very comfortable, very convenient, but um, money is made when, you know, you get the, the thesis right um, in the forward rate of change. So let's see if um, Decal is able to reward the shareholders in a consistent manner. Um, they have not created any serious wealth in the last um, many years um, since IPO, um, I think there are only five, um, 10, maybe 10 bagger today, nine bagger or something. So the IPO came at 160 bucks, there was a bonus and there was a split. So I think that 160 is 16. So that 16 from 2004 is what today, 150 or whatever. So yeah, it's nine X plus dividend. So again, many chemical companies have given much more than that. But again, there is, I think, I hope there is promise and they will get their act together and we should see some improvement going forward. I, I don't expect any immediate improvement in their financials, but yeah, over a period of time, um, I hope that um, they will improve their um, uh, earnings and, and they will reward shareholders. Piramal, I think is a, is a great play on uh, antibody drug conjugates. Uh, and they they diluted some stake to um, Carlyle recently. Debt is something on their balance sheet, which is I'm not very comfortable with, to be perfectly honest. So I'm not sure if the business is de-emerged. I would look at Piramal uh, today um, because of um, the, the debt angle. And also the fact that both Dishman and Piramal, the majority of their assets along with Lonza, they are outside India. So the asset turns will be compromised, right? So you cannot get... 2.53 XS tons um, that most of the, the complex APIs um, players um, and even um, something like um, Suvain Pharma and CDMO, they, although they are not on the biologic side, that they can command. Because if you are, um, if you have got resources, manufacturing facilities um, and scientific um, talent in India, it's a, it's a low asset turn, low OPEX country. Your asset turns are better relative to operating outside India, where majority of the assets of both Dishman and Piramal are, Lonza, of course, is, is anyway um, uh, a low asset turned business. <clears throat> then peptides also offer a lot of uh, promise because see, proteins and peptides are naturally occurring um, in the body. And there are a lot of um, diseases that these um, therapies and medicines can target, which uh, a normal chemical drug cannot. And, and a peptide could be a chemical or a, or a large peptide, which is biologic, uh, because ultimately our DNA is nothing but a, a chemical, right? Um, it's a nitrogen base, nucleotides. It, it, they are all, they are fundamentally, the genome is made of, uh, of chemicals. So uh, Newland is operating in the oral peptide. So it's, it's not the biologics uh, space. Uh, but I've included that to, you know, just um, show you that the peptides can come in both um, uh, varieties, um, um, chemical and genetically modified. Uh, Amgen and Biocon are the examples for the genetic, uh, genetically modified peptides. So, so insulin, as an example, um, that, that's, um, that's, that's a peptide. Uh, then, um, the key therapeutic area, so age reversal is, is, is one. CAR T we saw um, as one promising area. There's a lot of rare and orphan diseases where these therapies um, could come into play. Live um, biotherapeutic um, uh, products, so the Lonza, Hansen, JV, um, where they, they work with these um, probiotics or, uh, or um, uh, the, the microorganisms. Interestingly, one Indian company, which is not seen as a life sciences company, um, does work on uh, these microorganisms or bi micro consumables. Um, it's a B2B business and we have got um, cases study further down uh, on that business. So don't go anywhere. 
uh, then uh, peptides and peptide bodies. So peptide bodies are nothing but a combination of antibodies and peptides. So that's another area where a lot of research is going on. But I think the focus has to be again and again on the affordability and accessibility. No point having a best-in-class therapy which only a handful of people are able to afford, um, because majority of the population is 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 poor and you know um, they cannot afford that. Um, kind of therapy, so that's where biosimilars come into play, and and lastly, we've got some fermentation-based um, immunosuppressants uh, um, API. So the two examples I've got is um, Biocon and Krebs Biosciences. Uh, so Biocon, we know, is putting up a mammoth capex of uh, six billion um, Indian rupees um, uh, in a greenfield um, fermentation API plant in Vizac. And, and Krebs Biosciences, um, so IPCA Group have acquired them. They are um, doing all the right things, I think, um, to um, transform the business, turn it around. But I think um, it will take some time before we start to see the benefit. And that's the nature of the industry. You need to um, set up the infrastructure, get the licenses um, uh, reapproved, and then do the filings and do the the trial runs and then finally go commercial so maybe maybe in next few quarters um, not immediately for sure that Krebs biosciences may see some sort of um, reversal in their fortunes but they are working on some good um, uh, unique sort of stories in the sense that um, all the the uh, fermentation derived apis are currently being imported a majority of them i know biocon is working on some of them but china is the dominant uh, place. So there is definitely import substitution theme, which will come in favor of Krebs. So the industry structure is terrible today, but maybe 10 years later or five years later, it may be relatively better. Like it happened with the chemical industry and, and the APIs. And again, global low cost supply chain would also work into um, their favor. Um, few examples. So Sirashio um, um, Pep, um, Pep um, Pepti days and um, lower statin, simva statin, um, and some of the other molecules that Krebs are currently working on, and 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 Sirashio Pepti days is an is an interesting example because if you look at the annual report of advanced um, enzymes, which is the leader in this space, they were not worried about the competition competition in uh, in their previous annual reports, but in the recent annual reports, if you just search on this. Um, Sirashio uh, Peptide's um, name, you would find that they have started highlighting the, the risk of competition uh, coming. Um, so I'm not sure whether they are alluding to Krebs Biosciences or they are talking about in general, but they were not talking about this competitive risk um, in older annual reports. I think in last year and maybe the year um, before the last one, um, they have said, and I know Krebs Biosciences is working on many of these fermentation derived APIs. But yeah, the losses will stay. It will it will take some time to um, turn things around. Um, but that's the nature of um, the industry. Uh, so have a very small exposure today. And as they start um, delivering on the numbers, and I'm not worried about the stock price. Um, don't chase them. But when there are fundamental changes in the business in terms of um, the EBITDA improvement, the the profitability improvement, I think that would be a time to. Uh, uh, average it up um, as as they start delivering on the promise. Promise definitely is there. <clears throat> so age reversal by destroying those zombie cells is another uh, key interesting um, research that is going on. So if you look at uh, the, the world um, as a whole, um, the life expectancy has been gradually inching up because there are advances in public health, sanitation, nutrition, new drug discoveries, and so on. So uh, humans are expected to live longer uh, over the decades. And few few decades out, the 90 um, could become 60, right? Um, relatively speaking, because people A, are getting more health conscious uh, and the therapies are also improving. Uh, but then there is a problem of um, what's called uh, zombie cells, which refuse to die um, and they release. Uh, so the cells multiply up to a point. Any cell will multiply, let's say, X number of times, and then it will stop multiplying and it should die. But some of these zombie cells, they, they refuse to die. They release cytokines. They cause inflammation and age-related diseases potentially are, potentially are a result of these zombie cells. 
uh, a lot of research. Uh, so James Kirkland um, is, is, is one. I've got the reference if you want to um, dig deeper into the story. But there is, a, there is hope um, that five to 10 years down, we may have some therapies and hopefully with some tech transfer, there may be some Indian CDMOs making some of these therapies in, affordable for Indian masses. And that can uh, result in age reversal, uh, hopefully. Uh, so some of the, the investing options um, on both the animal and human biotech. So technology, guys, is the biggest moat um, in, in biotechnology business, right? But it's also the source of risk, as we saw in CRISPR um, um, uh, Cas9. You know, it, it, it cuts you both ways. If you get it right, you, you get it spot on. If you don't get it right, then there are some serious repercussions as well. Regulatory risk is also a significantly higher uh, um, barrier um, in, in biotechnology space um, relative to uh, the chemical drugs. Um, legal uh, and, and litigation risk is also there. And that's the reason, you know, we see players like Biocon partnering with Myelin and, uh, and, and some of the other um, such relationships across the globe because they don't want to um, take that litigation risk. And so have a partner and let them for. Um, share the risk and reward. You lose a bit of uh, cash flow, but your your predictability improves um, because it's kind of a zero or one. Otherwise, if you are taking that litigation risk, we see Natco taking the same. Although they are not in biologics space, but they have a similar mindset as well, where they partner with um, a foreign player who then takes ownership of the litigation uh, and the front end uh, distribution. Uh, logistical uh, challenges and and as a framework i tend to look for compounding cash flows uh, that i can assess rather than a promise of a mammoth cash flow in future which may or may not come so my framework is i look at how the cash flow has compounded or if something fundamentally is changing like i saw in the case of chemical industries and maybe apis that what the cash flows are today are nothing in comparison to what they would be five years out. And then if you understand that business, um, you can bet when no one else is betting on and you can just write a disproportionate alpha ahead of um, uh, the masses. Uh, so direct exposure uh, to I see any small biotechnology company is a very high risk. It's a very high risk and unless, and I've got a little cheat sheet uh, towards the back end of this presentation, unless you understand both the science and the economics, uh, I would encourage you not to directly participate in, in these cutting edge technology companies like CRISPR Biotherapeutics or Editors Medicine um, and so on. And, and you could have either exposure through CDMOs um, because they partner um, and they are much more sustainable, predictable business models or simply go with an ETF um, type approach. And I've got some examples, some um, ETFs um, in the presentation later on. So I, I like this XAAS, which is discovery as a service, development, manufacturing as a service, or an integrated DDM, drug discovery and manufacturing, which is um, Sinjin is one example. Uh, and we have got um, uh, others as well in India. Stellis um, is another emerging one today. You know, they don't do much revenue, but we'll come to Stellis um, uh, a little later. So yes, th there are risk reward. You have to understand what, what, what you are um, uh, signing up to. And that's, that's why you need to do a lot of research. You need to read those annual reports, multiple annual reports um, across the industry, you know, just to get a, a good handle on what could potentially be a good investment um, uh, rather than just taking a blinkered approach that, you know, having a, a biased uh, opinion about a certain business, either way, um, positive or negative. Uh, so, so come with an open sort of uh, mindset, uh, do your uh, research, um, um, dig deeper, uh, screen through various annual reports and con calls, and then decide whether you understand the underlying science um, and then if you do understand the underlying science and you're comfortable with the economics and the psychology of investing, then yeah, do invest directly. Otherwise, um, ETFs are perhaps a better option for you. Uh, so um, the reason I like the CDMO space is, is, is in, the, in the numbers. Um, the sector as a whole has massively outperformed. 
and we have data uh, to support that and and i have been very vocal about this in 2018 19 even last year when we had that um, uh, alpha series with um, uh, uh, indian investing conclave uh, in june of 2020 and and the reason i like these spaces because they are very well aligned to my framework so they they offer high entry barrier um, it takes years to establish credibility and win hearts and minds of your customers and once you have logged them in you have created those cell lines the exit barriers are are humongous and then operating leverage um, in invariably comes into play at some point in time so a good cdmo as anstein young um, said uh, you know seek to establish a lock in effect um, and this is especially true for biopharmaceuticals uh, an area in which replacing manufacturing partners is almost impossible and also time consuming because see it's an it's a patented product you have got a 15 year patent on it you have started the manufacturing if you want to disrupt um, uh, one supplier you won't do that for 5 10 15% um, price differential um, it doesn't happen because a there is a risk of tech transfer there is a risk of regulatory filing so typically these partners they work with at least two suppliers uh, a primary one and a secondary one and and both uh, ride a very sticky um, cash flow uh, typically a primary supplier could take 60 70% uh, revenue pie and the primary could be the in house right so Uh, BMS could do 60% manufacturing in house and ask Sinjin to do the other 40% as an example um, but once once you are there um, you um, tend to ride a very sticky um, cash flow and that's the reason you know they do justify 10 times 15 times price to sales multiple uh, so this is something um, um, i tweeted recently um, you know the chinese companies look it took them 16 17 um, years 11 years in some cases to get 200 million uh, sales but the next four years and they quadrupled those sales and that's that's the hockey stick as we as we call because it takes it's a long gestation high capex business but once you hit that sort of inflection point it's a very rapid and and then at that point in time it's almost impossible to catch because the the pe would look uh, optically expensive to you and you will never be able to ride because it gives you no time really to in- research the business so you have to research the business up front understand when the operating leverage is likely to kick in and then you need to position uh, the beauty of these cdmo businesses is that the moment the molecule enters the space they make money and if the drug fails as part of the discovery and development process it fails that's fine you you made your money um, as part of the discovery and the development cycle if the drug fails it fails you your scientists will move on to the next um, available molecule if the drug is successful there is a there is a potential opportunity to you for you as the cdmo player to participate in the manufacturing of the same drug because you have been supporting that molecule you understand um, the science a little better than you know a potential tech transfer could um, uh, could um, enable a, a, a very fresh um, source um, of supplier for that innovator and because it's a it's innovator synthesis it's all patent protected so there is never a pricing pressure so if when when the molecule is live it's commercial it's commercial there is no pricing pressure for next 15 years or you know the duration of that patent so the cash flows are very predictable the margins are so typically you would find a bio cdmo reporting 80% gross margin 75% maybe um dishman does 85% gross margins by the way and, and then um you also find a high operating uh, so 30 to 40% even 50% i've seen in some cases 50% operating margins um Uh, in in case of um, global cdmos on the biologics um, side as well uh, so it's a, it's a very um, very good um, uh, business that kind of fundamentally um, uh, gels with my investing uh, framework of looking at the industry structure the business and the management uh, so i've got some detailed reference here if, in case you have not seen the other so it is a master class on global custom development and manufacturing opportunity that i presented 
on IRC last year. So I've got that link here if you are interested. Uh, it's a two and a half hour, very boring uh, presentation. Uh, but if you are interested in this space, you might get something out of it. Uh, so here is an example of that hockey stick, uh, which, uh, so this is from Fujifilm and, and look, 16% um, was the growth rate up, up until 2018, right? And then all of a sudden, uh, the, the, the growth jumps. And when this happens, the operating leverage will be disproportionate. So you won't find earnings growing 50%, you would find earnings are doubling and then doubling again. So, and that, that has happened with Wuxi Biologics, that has happened with many uh, players. Uh, and there could be a couple of Indian assets um, that may, uh, you know, uh, go this path. Uh, and we have got one um, on Stellis um, in, this, in this presentation. Uh, but I think before we get to Stellis, let's have a look at the vaccines. So they have been making a um, lot of um, noise uh, for all the various reasons and uh, we saw that opportunity um, last year actually so here's what i tweeted in november that you know biosciences including vaccine manufacturing will take a fair share of most people hearts and minds because i saw that coming and there was no other way to get out of this pandemic vaccines were the only sort of one possible way out and how do you manufacture them in mass scale and how do you make them affordable you have to have um, you know an indian skin in the game and that's exactly how the things are um, panning out um, we have um, so dr dr bansal is a pharmacologist and he takes very keen interest in researching and i always um, read his tweets very very carefully um, at least two three times um, because Sometimes they could be cryptic, um, but I think uh, they give you some really good tangible leads in terms of, you know, where the landscape is, is shifting. And he gave us those names from strides all the way to Panacea uh, in uh, last year. And almost all of them have performed um, since November 2020, right? Uh, so he tweeted this on 28th of November. And the reason I have highlighted, uh, so by the way, I've explained, you know, what the various vaccines are, uh, the one that we are interested in here in India, uh, the others as well. So I've not included the, the Bharat Biotech. I know Zydus is on the verge of um, uh, getting their clinical three trial successful as well. But I've included these. So these are generated from a safe or genetically re-engineered um, humor or animal adenovirus. The, the difference between J&J Oxford is that the adenovirus, so in case of J&J, it's a human adenovirus. And in case of Oxford, it's a chimpanzee. And the reason they, they targeted chimpanzee was because um, it, if you have had that cold, so adenovirus is the common cold virus, right? So if you've had that before, you may uh, not get the required immune response. I think probably that's the reason Oxford has gone for the, the uh, the chimp and the chimp version of that um, adenovirus whereas the sputnik is very interesting uh, sputnik has got um, ad26 and ad5 so completely two different um, um, sort of um, uh, formulations uh, injectables there uh, in in those two shots so again sputnik is also a two shot vaccine but those two shots are are different um, uh, sort of viruses uh, and they they believe um, that the the efficacy um, will be which we, we, we will be better. So I think it's anyway 90% plus for a Sputnik. Um, so I think there is a lot of um, promise um, for Sput both for Sputnik and Oxford um, and JNJ, of course. But I think JNJ is expensive, at least for India. And I don't think there is any player that is manufacturing this. Uh, and then of course there are DNA vaccines. So DNA vaccines are cheaper to make. Um, but the challenge is, is the delivery. You have to get through the cytoplasm and then all the way to the, to the bunker or the nucleus where the DNA is. RNA vaccines are relatively new. Uh, so uh, Moderna and uh, BioNTech have um, um, synthesized them. Um, they are delivered inside, you know, tiny oily capsules called lipid nanoparticles, and they are expensive. Um, and, and the logistical challenges are also there because you need to store them at a really low temperature. 
and there is currently no tech transfer or or an indian supplier manufacturer because they have to be locally manufactured you can't you can't transport it's not it's not economical and they are expensive already uh, so i think from from an indian perspective uh, sputnik and oxford um, offer promise and of course our in house bharat biotech vaccine and and cadela um, i hope uh, and pray that they they also because we need lots and lots of vaccines um, uh the the vaccines market globally is uh, 30 32 billion pre pandemic and then in the pandemic we have so globally all, all the the governments put together they have um order for some 35 billion uh doses is right um, so it's 7 billion population why 35 billion because um they they want to procure uh, more um, because there could be some wastage some expiry you know there these vaccines have got a use by date of course so 35 billion even if you take a very nominal 3 4 dollar type of pricing it's 100 billion plus um market over this year and next year whereas the pre covid vaccine market in total was just 30 billion so imagine the scale of opportunity here and that's the reason we had you know um, uh, every interest from an investing perspective to participate in this opportunity because it's humongous um, what is 30 billion relative to you know a, a one or two year opportunity of 100 billion 150 billion that type of range and the reason i've highlighted two names here wokard and, and panisius because both have got some challenges on their business model and the balance sheet so wokard has got um, astrazeneca manufacturing here in the uk but on their r&d side um, they have not done much on the biosciences so they have got no products in the us um, they have got some biosimilars in india but they are going sort of in 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 a very specific direction of um, uh, anti um, bacterial resistance right so um, Uh, those those are the so they they want to target um, the the bacterial resistance as their core uh, for the uh, but balance sheet is very stretched and they have done several rounds of restructuring along the way so i i've seen you know some restructuring or the other happening in wokard every few years they've got some regulatory challenges as well uh, on their um, several plants uh, so uh, i have got no exposure uh, in wokard uh, but i highlighted that because you know the balance sheet uh, balance sheet is not um, immaculate there and likewise for panacea panacea has got uh, a weak balance sheet as well and um, they pay a lot of interest costs because of the way the uh, the whole restructuring was done uh, with, with 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 the piramal group but i i believe that given what they have now in terms of this vaccine opportunity for sputnik a single year of um operating cash flows um can just um immunize their uh, balance sheet and and make them you know much more uh, leaner and fitter uh, going into the future and then it's a very um, science based um so that's the reason i i tweeted this yesterday because i wanted to use this today so sterile infrastructure does not guarantee a tech transfer vaccine manufacturing is a completely different ball game biologics map manufacturing is a different ball game so um, if you compare serum institute with biocon what serum can do uh, biocon uh, won't be able to and vice versa because biologics um, although vaccines come under biologics the the core um, competence is very different you need a very different sort of scientific talent and the technology itself is is different and you need to have you know the the mechanism to uh, put the cell lines in place and and finally do the the scale of fermentation so the real moat is on the scientist side you could have multiple sort of um tech transfer and manufacturing alliances and and arrangements so i think what analysts need to do in in future con calls is all the companies that have announced you know the tie ups with various players to manufacture those vaccines and some of these tie ups are 5 months old already the analysts have to ask you know what's the progress um, have you uh, completed the scale up where ex- exactly are you in the development cycle what i find people in india asking on these con calls is the ebitda margin for the next quarter or the next year they they 
tend to look at very extreme short term and sometimes i believe that they miss asking the the right set of questions which is in case of vaccine you have to ask you know what is the the timeline for shipment uh, because you signed the contract 5 months back where are you in that um, synthesis cycle what have you done rather than asking you know what sort of pricing or ebitda you expect uh, this company to make because then that will give them that response to that question will give them a better handle uh, in terms of the cash flows it's all about cash right so you need to understand where this company is in the journey of going commercial so panacy as an example they made this announcement very recently and they are confident that you know the the first shipment um, could be out by the end of june so within within 3 months they believe in their technology they believe in their scientists uh, and they believe that they have what it takes to get this um, thing rolling which i think is a very smart uh, turn around by by any standard and perhaps one of those facilities that is bsl3 lab you need you need you need uh, bio safety level 3 uh, for this type of uh, incredibly complex manufacturing and and perhaps that's the reason bio bharat biotech is is actively engaging with panacea so there is there is potential that they could be manufacturing um, bharat biotech's vaccine uh, as well in addition to uh, uh, sputnik so i i think um, i think uh, panacea has um, um, serious um, uh, opportunity to deleverage their balance sheet over the next year or two and come back um, in black and then stay in black because the other parts of their business uh, are already uh, doing well they have um, made some misses steps in the past around about 2005 2007 where they went for their debt funded capex and they got the wrong end of the stick there but uh, universe never gave them a second opportunity uh, perhaps now you know they have this opportunity and um, i think management is um, is is trustworthy um, i have seen mr rajesh jain on couple of recent television interviews i believe that um, he and the scientific team have what it takes and by the way as a disclosure i first invested in panacea bay back in 2016 at somewhere in the region of 100 110 bucks and covid was nowhere uh, on the horizon back then my my sole premise was that the downside is limited and i had some sort of psychological mental stop loss that i am entering a business at 110 bucks i was mentally prepared to cut my losses if the price were to go below a certain threshold which i had in my mind it never triggered that sort of threshold um so downside was limited but now uh, we have this vaccine opportunity which is a massive game changer uh, uh, in my view as far as uh, many of these vaccine players in some cases the valuations are rich so um, uh, gland pharma is one which i think um, uh, has got the most um, expensive valuations in terms of price to sales Um, but because if you compare the gross margins of gland pharma i think they are not 75 80% where bio cdmos are so i'm not too sure about the valuations of gland pharma um, but i think i have got investments um, in uh, most of these names x uh, work hard uh, as a disclosure and then looking at so another uh, brilliant um, a tweet uh, in on in november uh, from uh, dr bansal he he kind of gave us everything that we needed to sort of model uh, in this spreadsheet you know what the future opportunity could look like uh, year by year break up and this is unicef data right so this is what uh, the opportunity looks like in terms of the 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 doses uh, the capacity and where do you think has uh, the world has got the capacity it has to be uh, india um, dominated uh, supply uh, if if these vaccines are to be uh, made affordable for the masses and this this may not be a one year two year because the pandemics if you look at the spanish flu um, if you do google if spanish flu came it stayed for a number of years and then it disappeared all of uh, by itself pandemics they don't stay for a year or 6 months they they potentially drag on so today india is facing the brunt tomorrow it could be uk 
it could be you know us the other day it could be japan it won't be china so no surprises there but it could be any country other than china tomorrow right let's be honest about it so the they keep doing this you know passing the parcel sort of uh, for want of a better word so my sense is that this opportunity is here to stay uh, it's not a extreme short term opportunity is at least a medium term and this could become a flu type vaccine going forward so here in the uk at a certain age um, every uh, month in in us as well you you take that flu jab and it's an annual recurring uh, sort of um, event um, for the consumers as well as the nhs and and this um, covid vaccine could become that um, going forward but i think we first need to vaccinate the entire global population and we have just scratched the surface um, as far as the numbers are concerned so i think this year and next year in even at the end of next year uh, i don't think you know the entire globe will get vaccinated because we haven't got the capacity we simply haven't got the capacity so someone needs to manufacture those vaccines manufacture them fast at a quality at a price point where it's affordable so uh, the next one uh, is a stellis bio um, so any uh, a very interesting uh, so this is inside strides it's not separately listed by the way right uh, so here is a disclosure from strides they went for a a, a funding round which valued stellis at close to 2600 crores stellis hasn't got any revenues uh, maybe one or two million usd revenues as arun kumar confirmed on a recent con call so imagine a business being valued at 2600 crores without having any sales now imagine what the potential is um, ahead of this business and and i'm just trying to use my past experience um, uh, from this sector i think 5 years out so 2026 financial year this could be a 75 80 to 85% gross margin business <coughs> with or without vaccine uh, ebitda margins in the region of anywhere from 30% to 50% high cash um, to ebitda conversion Uh, so i've seen this with uh, sinjin uh, 90% plus cash conversion even sequence scientific i like businesses where cfo to ebitda conversion is high i i generally avoid if it's a too low a value so 70 75% maybe it's okay anything above 80% is is a thumbs up um, for me so i expect stellis to be uh, Uh, tier one in terms of the margins and tier one in terms of the cash flow to ebitda but not not tomorrow i'm talking about fi26 um, it's an a grade management and there are sector tailwinds so if you again look at my <clears throat> framework industry structure positive management is a grade business is getting better with this sputnik vaccine deal so i think all the ducks are aligned <clears throat> excuse me is just a matter of um, time when they uh, start uh, delivering they have got good um, talent here they have got the right sort of facility design and with this uh, fresh round of funding they will uh, go for a massive capacity creation uh, i hope it will be a brownfield expansion because it's faster um, to come on line come on stream and they need capacity today to get this vaccine they already have that capacity i think they are already increasing that capacity that's the reason the investors have given them the valuation that they have given them uh, and if um, i look at so look at the economics of this business so this is serum institute guys and these margins are not ebitda margins they are not operating margins they are net margins so that that's exactly what i was alluding to that there are certain businesses where net margins are far superior than the operating margins that you go for and you pay 20 times 15 times multiples to these chemical companies for a much inferior margin you do because they are trading someone is buying and someone is selling these businesses the chemical businesses that are at 15 to 20 times price to sales listed on nsc no names okay so this is the economics of the vaccine play so the, it's a great business it's not a good business it's a great business right now you come to sputnik i have made some assumption um, 
they have only disclosed 200 million doses so i'm taking a very conservative 3.5 dollar because it's an export opportunity and sputnik would be selling it at no less than 10 dollars or something so i've taken a very conservative three and a half uh, hopefully it will be more than that but let's assume that it's three and a half dollar per dose now look at the numbers currently so the green is their base business so forget the vaccine vaccine is blue the green is their base business and arun kumar um, confirmed that you know we don't have a top line now his talis does not have revenues or significant revenues a couple of million dollars and we intend to uh, we mentioned that in the next uh, fiscal year will break even and he was answering to one of my questions where he said it will take four to five years before we see a hockey stick type of growth so that's the reason i'm assuming fi26 uh, purely translating what uh, arun kumar said on that con call so that's on their base business the green uh, thing and i'm expecting some sort of a hockey stick um, uh, at, at this point in time uh, and I, and i believe i'm conservative but i i prefer to be conservative but look at this blue thing which is the vaccine right this is a serious opportunity 200 million over um, this year and next and i'm not assuming this to be a recurring opportunity simply because i've not seen the public disclosure but i believe that the pandemic is not going to go away and this will be a recurring revenue stream and they have the technology uh, platform to do multiple vaccines so tomorrow if pfizer or moderna vaccine uh, is approved for um, sale in india or in the region stellis could potentially participate in that opportunity as well or some other vaccine because it's a very fungible capacity and which they are expanding so i believe over the next 10 years this could be a serious wealth creation opportunity and management is doing the right thing by demerging and this is exactly what i hope that cadillas and the lupins of the world would do as well because when you demerge your business gets focus and shareholders start quizzing you on con calls and you know you are always on your toes to perform but i think the landscape looks very interesting to stellis um, strides have been a very long term investor um, i've been holding is for years and years and i have made plenty of money the share price won't tell you that there was a big dividend um, which is a corporate record uh, in india where they paid you know a massive amount of dividend the stock used to be 60 70 bucks in um, the gfc time great financial crisis on that investment they paid a dividend of 500 rupees or something and they have been paying a dividend annually as well so whatever you see as the share price is just you know nothing relation in relation to what the investor paid um, 10 years uh, ago or, or 12 years ago and investing to me is not a one year two year game that is trading anything that is less than three years in my head is pure trading anything which is five years seven years 10 years 15 years that's that's investment of course you cannot buy right and sleep that doesn't work you need to buy and continuously reassess on a quarterly basis not daily don't do it on a daily basis because the stories don't change on a daily basis news flows and media and twitter that's all bollocks ignore that track the business on a quarterly basis don't sleep on it and see you know if your thesis is intact and if it's intact just hold on to it because healthcare pharmaceutical businesses they compound they are not cyclical they are not steel businesses where नीचे पे भाव पे लेके ऊपर नहीं बेच मारा तो एग्जिट गया एंड देन यू वुड बी स्ट्रगलिंग फॉर नेक्स्ट फाइव सेवन इयर्स टू फाइंड द नेक्स्ट एग्जिट दैट्स हाउ दिस साइकिल्स पैन आउट राइट इफ यू आर नॉट राइट यू आर नॉट राइट देन यू कीप वेटिंग दीज आर मच मोर स्ट्रक्चरल ट्रेंड बिजनेसेस एंड यू कैन सिट ऑन देम पेशेंटली एज लॉन्ग एज योर कोर थीसिस इज इंटैक्ट एंड द द कैश फ्लो द मैनेजमेंट द इंडस्ट्री स्ट्रक्चर इज ऑल positive as per that that framework so yes i am i am optimistic and um, not a recommendation uh, i have that uh, disclaimer up front um, there is no recommendation i am not sebi registered i am definitely not your financial advisor so consult whosoever you want but do not um, just go and blindly start buying these uh, examples uh, from monday do not do that because there will be a 30 40% dip it will it will come every six months or one year there is a panic uh, sale that happens uh, in india and elsewhere and if you buy on borrowed conviction 
you won't be able to hold. So I'll give you one example. Sinjin was 300 plus before that COVID meltdown happened in March and it came all the way to 220. And if you don't understand the CDMO business, you would panic. You would panic much earlier than 220. You would panic at 260, 270, 250, you're gone. Sara mal big jayega, kuch bachega nahi. So don't do that. Understand the business. And if you are convinced about the, the story and you're convinced about the valuation, then go for that. But do check the valuation of some of the chemical companies against this benchmark. Take a screenshot. I don't know when the recording will be out. You take a screenshot and then you compare this. And then you see how is your portfolio looking today. So if you're comfortable holding that business, paying 15 times, 10 times price to sales where the margins are much inferior or you're comfortable with a bio CDMO business. So that's something uh, as a homework for you uh, maybe tomorrow. Uh, next one, another interesting um, play, Laura's Bio. Um, so um, this was the company, uh, Rich Core, that um, Laura's Labs acquired recently. And um, many people I saw um, the eyebrows were raised and they thought that, you know, Dr. Satya Chawa is um, paid, um, overpaid for this acquisition. I think he paid half price. He could have easily paid double uh, and still uh, the acquisition would have made sense. Uh, and, and the people who were saying that, you know, the, he overpaid, I think those people, they don't understand science. They are uh, the PE and the price to book uh, valuation analysts um, who have been investing in the commodities for, you know, better part of their investing career. Um, they don't understand science. Right. If you understand science, you would never say that it was a pricey acquisition. It was a damn cheap acquisition. And that's the reason I was shouting, you know, when people were the waving the red flags and, you know, the cash and whatnot. Price was 260 or something. Um, and I added at that point in time and I tweeted as well. Um, not everyone was impressed by my active tweeting, but I don't give a damn. Uh, I do what I think is right. Uh, I never misguide anyone. So I believe in my research. I believe in my conviction. And I thought, you know, it was a great acquisition uh, from Dr. Chava. And there's a massive growth runway ahead of this business. Massive. Um, they, they are participating in insulin manufacturing. They are participating in vaccine manufacturing. So trypsin um, goes into um, all sorts of... Um, so here is, uh, again, this gentleman has been tweeting. So this so acquisition happened uh, around this date. And I gave my sort of uh, uh, perspective on this acquisition. But then you look at this. So Laura's Bio has been used by Serum Institute. So trypsin goes into vaccine manufacturing. And imagine the vaccine landscape today. Then if that's not... Um, all um, Laura's Bio has been indig indigenously developing two key enzymes. And these two key enzymes are, uh, they are used in RT-PCR testing and they, they were imported. So no one in India was manufacturing these enzymes. So that's the quality of the business. It's, it's a futuristic business. You cannot value, you will not get this type of business. So people are paying 15, 20 times price to sale for what is, a uh, run of the mill chemical business in, in 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 my head whereas this this is a is a biologics business and people were uh, sort of raising eyebrows that what they paid the reason i came up with this comparison was very simple uh, i have been through the the, the life cycle of um, biocon ever since the ipo in 2004 i have tracked every single con call so um where um, Biocon was in, in late 90s, 1999 rather, versus the technology that Richcore has today, Richcore is already ahead of where Biocon was. Now, the biologics pathway was not clear. It was hagey and foggy and misty. So take an analogy. Uh, um, um, Biocon management was driving in a foggy weather. It was hazy, the, the pathway was not visible. So they were driving cautiously. Accident now, ho karke, right? Now the pathway is clear, relatively. So what took Biocon 20 years to get to where they are today, a, and company with 
the cash flows that Laura Slabs is generating, right? Thousand crore plus operating cash flows and they will be compounding and rising. Biocon was not having access to those cash flows in 1999. So A, it's a better regulatory landscape, better pathway, much more clear pathway. The growth opportunities are, are much better in enzymes and therapeutic proteins. And the cash flow is, a, is multiple times better than Biocon was in 1999. So you put all these three factors together, you could potentially get to where Biocon got to in 20 years between, say, let's say 1999 and 2020. Laurus Bio could do it much, much faster. Much, much faster. So that's the reason I kind of formulated this um, to help people, retail in particular. I know institutions are anyway having access to um, all sorts of databases and they have got, you know, um, infinite um, uh, analytical tools as well. But this was me trying to help my retail followers to better understand and not panic because there was a lot of chatter, red flags and, and whatnot. And, and some of these, these, these Twitter handles are quite um, um, seasoned guys with many followers. And I was just trying to counter um, them uh, along with some other people uh, like um, uh, Dr. Puneet Bansal and, and, and some other same um, people um, as well. Um, so the opportunity landscape is huge um, and this business can beautifully scale up uh, going forward. Um, and I believe, you know, it was a great acquisition. They've got massive capex unfolding and five years down the road. I mean, no one would talk about uh, Laura's being an ARV dominated play. It will look a completely different sort of landscape, more oncology, more diabetes, evacaftor on cystic fibrosis, you know, so, um, they've got, they've got uh, some niche, um, nutraceutical and cosmetology filings as well. And of course, they've got the CDMO business, which is best in class. They have said that many times on con calls, the, 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 the traditional CDMO X, uh, Laura's bio in terms of margins and everything. So I think we have got a fantastic opportunity ahead of us. I look forward to uh, the next quarterly commentary from, from the management uh, and just continue to track this business and see where it goes. Uh, then Sinjin, I've, I've detailed many times, I've tweeted a lot, but um, I just wanted to highlight, you know, look at the, the partnership that these, none of the Indian players have this breadth. And the capacity that Sinjin has on the biologic side is way, way more than any of the Indian um, uh, listed or unlisted player, right? X biocon of course, but biocon is not a CDMO. So I'm not um, taking that into consideration. So it's, it's a beautiful uh, business. Um, I think operating leverage will come into play. It may not be this quarter. I don't expect next few quarters to be really great, but I think over a period of time, Currently, I think since IPO, so IPO was what, 125 bucks, it got listed at 155 or something. So it is already compounding at 30% plus from the listing price. From IPO price, it's much more than that, right? So IPO came in 2015. So I, I bought it in the IPO because I was a Biocon shareholder. We got some uh, uh, fixed uh, sort of quota. And then I bought it first day, first show on listing as well. And I've never sold a single stock and I keep averaging up um, as they continue to deliver. And I believe that, you know, it's a very promising story. No point um, detailing this because the title is the unseen trends. Uh, Sinjin, I think, and Biocon, I think are very much seen. So I'm, I'm just I'm not going to invest much time detailing um, about them. Uh, so coming to industrial uh, biotechnology, this will be, let me just see the time. So it's one o'clock. Um, Ishmoid, what's the sense? I mean, we, this will likely take at least half an hour, if not more. Should we take a break here or we just finish this and then do a break, five minute break before the Q&A? I think so. We should take a break. It just like gives an opportunity to, to the audience to process the information. Yeah, sure. And, and get their questions as well. And um, keep sending to the chat box. And um, I'm more than happy to answer all your questions hindi mein poocho angrezi mein poocho sab chalta hai jo puchna hai puchho paisa diya hai paisa vasool hona chahiye we have taken the questions in the uh, 
in the google form so, so at the end we'll uh, we'll have sure. a session sure guys so let's take a 5 minute break and then this don't go anywhere we have got some very interesting um, case studies coming up next perhaps this will be even more interesting than the previous section definitely definitely so we are getting into this log overs so we are about i think 30 over mark and we have got wickets intact and and we are looking for a very high scoring game so don't go anywhere <laughs> right okay be back soon guys bye uh, we will be back in 5 minutes right guys i'm <clears throat> i'm back and ready to go whenever you think is 5 minutes or so i'm not been keeping time and on us 4 minutes fast or we, we can start right sir can we should we ah uh, we should start chalo theek hai so um, industry by bi industry biotechnology i think is a is a great uh, space within the bio um, technology universe and one which has been under appreciated over the years but i think going forward this is one area which will massively surprise because there's a lot of disruption across the industries from textiles um, to um, uh, construction um, to energy sector a lot of um, pro, um, alternate um, uh, proteins nutraceuticals probiotics a lot of um, um, Uh, opportunity for massive growth uh, over the next um, couple of decades um, as this industry 5 um, vision 2 um, um, unfolds um, uh, between now and um, uh, and going forward so again these are the areas it's it's a big sorry i think it's my mic right <laughs> right right it was that <laughs> got you so yeah it's enzymes fermentation um, functional foods cultured meat probiotics nutraceuticals dairy sugar paper textile i mean look at the number of industries oil and gas i think i've excluded that one um, but i have examples so this industrial biotechnology biocatalysis you know the use of enzymes in api synthesis as an example detergent so we know the performance um, enhances um, and there was a novozyme video that um, dr puneet bansal shared uh, i think Um, at least once if not twice so there are many sectors that will get positively impacted uh, with uh, with this uh, industrial bioscience uh, so again industrial biotechnology is also known as white biotechnology and it deals with the use of enzymes and microorganisms in various industries uh, for the production of food ingredients biochemicals nutraceuticals probiotics biofuels consumer goods and all the rest of it and i found this definition from novozyme uh, really uh, worthwhile uh, and i have been um, positive about this space i have been Uh, writing my thoughts um, sharing with um, all of you and here are some of the logos as an example so these are the the giants within the industrial uh, biosciences space today and uh, and i'm sure some of the indian companies their current market cap is so small relative to the opportunity that they can scale up massively over the next decade or so and you know a tremendous amount of wealth creation will hopefully happen along the way uh so again just looking at some of the examples um, microbial fermentation te technology platform what it could do in the clean energy space multimodal transportation heating electricity um, then increasing the efficiencies um, the bio nutrients so one indian company um, is active in this space um, we have that case study uh, industrial enzymes are used in almost every sector um, then you have got fermented food so kefir i am not sure whether you guys get it in india it's it's a it's a great product we get here in the in the uk i I've, i've seen it recently in the last few um, years or months rather and and i really like uh, the product um, so there are a lot of more and more fermented foods will come into play cultured meat we have multiple um, businesses as an example there functional foods uh, probiotics nutraceuticals hmos so a human milk um, oligosaccharides uh, is a key component of mother's milk um, they don't get digested but they enhance the pro 
the gut the gut microbe and the probiotics and chr hansen being you know one of the industry leaders they saw this as an opportunity and they have recently last year i think acquired this um, um hmo player um, so definitely there's a lot of potential for innovation and growth in this space renewable chemicals and materials we have not even started so bioplastic as an example and again that indian company has got you know the patents the technology um, to you know play a, a significant role in the space of uh, renewable chemicals and materials and bioplastics being just one of those uh, possibilities and just participating in creating a more circular economy because if you remember the motto of industry 5 uh, vision 2 is sustainability so industrial biotechnology is something that will make it sustainable without that there is no sustainability and we will run out of fossil fuel at some point we will you know uh, damage our soil with continuous use of chemical uh, pesticides um, and 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 so on so industrial biotechnology has got a massive um, uh, role to play just a quick comparison between cellular and acellular so cellular is something where the whole product whole bio whole cell biomass is consumed right so you consume everything acellular is where you influence that microbe to you create those conditions um, temperature and um, ingredients um, in the the growth uh, media and everything and you try and influence that microorganism to synthesize some enzyme or some um, product which you then can purify Uh, control the yield because the yield is very critical in this industry, and then you could use that um, as as um, as your end product. So genetically engineered organisms. Um, so insulin, as an example, right? And that's one precision fermentation. Lot of technologies around a cellular. Some is into cellular, but there is also a cellular, and we have got plenty of examples both in India and outside India um, to um, keep you guys. Um, uh, you know informed about what's happening in this space uh, so why do we need biotechnology in food production so if you look at the sustainable angle it, uh, there's a sustainability angle there is health um, angle use of antibiotics um, etc it's much more efficient uh, it takes less uh, resources be it water um, or or energy or or land and is good for the environment so i think overall it's a win win but um, um before you start punching the buy orders there are significant challenges so i have covered both the pros and the cons um, of the uh, the alternate protein industry um, so let's see so a case in point for alternate proteins um 10 billion global population demand rising for protein protein consumption is on the rise Uh, record amount of money is being thrown uh, over three billion. Uh, you look at you know uh, the investments that have gone, and you look at the the economics. So, energy use, greenhouse gas, land, water. So, beef is the single largest culprit here, and lab meat is the cleanest one. But poultry is not bad. Poultry is not taking as much um, as as a beef, as an example, or maybe sheep. Um, so, it kind of in this order. Uh, so if you if you are if you are a, if you eat chicken or eggs you uh, can be less guilty uh, compared to someone who is eating beef uh, you know if that if that helps uh, <clears throat> cultivated meat has been the fastest growing in capital investment yeah we saw that and plant based and fermented foods have attracted significant capital but some of the valuations are really absurd in this plant based and i've got one little um um data based um, point to just prove my thesis that why i believe that the valuations in the listed space are absurd in the plant based um, uh, uh, alternate protein space so here is a is a is a good um, example of all the various businesses uh, so plant based beyond meat corn corn is a very old enterprise here in the uk um, 25 years if not more and they never really um took off in any many any meaningful way so i have tried their product once or twice i mean it's okay um i must so i've been living in the uk for 20 years and i must have bought corn for maybe i've consumed it for less than 10 times in those 20 years right and then there is impossible food and guardian uh, i think this is the conagra 
one uh, and even nestle um, is into plant based um, uh, burgers and um, other players like the the the, uh, the tyson foods uh, the uh, the cargills of the world they all are uh, putting a foot in the uh, door as far as the uh, the uh, plant based proteins are concerned then you've got many um, good um, potential options in cultured meats so blue nalu uh, memphis meat moza uh, lf farm the uh, the israeli company shiok meats is the one in singapore uh, and then clear meat i think is is one in india if i'm not mistaken uh, not much information on this one because i checked their website i, I couldn't found much but some of the other ones have got much more detailed on their website so you know it's worth researching them uh, if you want to cultured pet food eggs fermentation dairy air fermentation protein so i've got at least one slide on each of these then we've got companies and growth media um, Bioreactor, so Thermo Fisher is not the only one there. There are others as well. So Merck Millipore is a is a is a serious competitor in the bioreactor space. And we have got bioprinting and scaffolding companies as well. But look at look at the investments in the last one year. Look at the money that is um, being pumped into this space. So that kind of tells you about um, the uh, the future. Um, uh, in terms of um, over the next five, 10 years. So uh, here is one um, uh, example of air protein. So before you understand this, I mean, this is a very old technology. It was developed by NASA in 60s. And the whole premise was if the astronaut is going on a long voyage and um, they would be exhaling CO2, which these microbes would consume um, to produce food. And then astronauts would um, consume that food and it will be a circular. Uh, uh, economy uh, recycle right so that was the technology which they never used but i think air protein has and and other companies uh, have been leveraging this so it's all based on co2 energy and these hydrogenotrophs which are the microbes they do the precision fermentation and the protein is 80 percent um, uh, content whereas uh, relative to the soy which is only 40 percent so it's a better product and it's more environment friendly and then you can mix this um, air protein into you know your yogurts and you know other cereals and whatnot and that kind of creates a very sustainable um, dynamics uh, and and the margins um, i suppose the only challenge i think with these technologies not only with this one and the others as well they need to scale up uh, and they need to uh, reduce their um, cost um, uh, further and uh, to make them viable they, they may not be that viable today, but I think over the next two, three years, um, not, not 10 years, I think over the next two, three years, they uh, should become uh, much more viable. Uh, here is another one, uh, very similar. Um, so there might be slight differences in the process and the technology and the use of micros, but fundamentally uh, speaking is the same um, technology. Uh, Novo nutrients again. Look at the look at the pitch, right? So protein demand is rocketing, and climate change uh, is threatening, right? So there's a there's a massive um, CO2 greenhouse gas emission, uh, which can be used to create protein. So that's 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 the brilliant um, sort of um, recycled um, economics led by technology. So they recycle CO2 from polluting industries into sustainable protein feed. How good is that, right? Um, again, challenges, you need to scale up and reduce your cost to become viable. Uh, but I think, you know, there is a lot of uh, potential um, in these technologies over, over the medium term. Uh, Deep Branch, again, is a very similar story. Um, so instead of um, importing um, soy and fish meal all the way from Americas, um, to the UK, and this British company is trying to use um, uh, recycling CO2 using microorganisms. Again, same NASA technology, uh, more or less. Um, the key differentiation being they're using CO2 versus um, sugar or methane. Um, and then um, they create uh, something very similar to uh, fish meal or soy, but it's not, it's not a commodity. And so there is, there is no price fluctuation. 
um, in in what they are creating, uh, and also um, uh, it makes um, less ninety percent less carbon burn uh, and and import substitution sort of uh, theme uh, here in the UK as well for this company. Uh, here is a, a detailed sort of blueprint of how, how they are doing it. Um, so how the carbon dioxide from the industry is going into this fermenter. They are getting uh, hydrogen from uh, the electrolysis and then how they are synthesizing this uh, proton, which is, which is the, the, the key uh, protein and what potential uses they could put that. Uh, so that, that is an example of clean uh, protein. Um, then moving on to fermentation, um, uh, fermented dairy. So we have got um, new culture and several um, other um, such players. Again, thesis is similar. You have got microorganisms and sugar. You do precision fermentation and you get uh, milk protein and dairy products um, out of it. That's an interesting place. So it's a, it's a turtle tree is a Singapore um, based um, company. They are um, uh, uh, replicating human breast milk uh, by growing the, the memory glands and then uh, proliferating them, uh, filtering them um, and having, you know, um, even HMOs, they claim that, you know, human milk oligosaccharides are part of their and their, um, their product. And this is, uh, they harvest by separating the cell biomass using filtration. So this is a cellular example, right? We saw, uh, again, it, it's a great promising story. I think they're more of a B2B model. So they are not directly supplying to the end consumer. They have got uh, tires with the Danons and the Nestle's of the world. Uh, but I like, I like um, Singapore as a country because they have been very progressive uh, in embracing science. Um, and I think, um, countries like India, they have an opportunity as well to embrace the power of biotechnology. We definitely need some policy um, announcements um, and reforms in this area. And I'm sure the government is uh, very um, taking very keen interest. I've seen some tweets from various um, uh, Twitter handles, and that gives me a lot of uh, confidence that, you know, things are moving in the right direction uh, as far as Indian bio biotechnology space is concerned. And another, so, so this is, guys, a custom synthesis of human milk for, this is a pure custom synthesis uh, based milk uh, for, for the baby, right? So we, they look at the, look at the, the economy. So they collect the sample of memory cells, uh, moms, uh, mothers, that is, and then they synthesize and, 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 and culture them, precision fermentation uh, is used, and then they package the milk for custom made for this uh, baby. How good is that? I mean, again, so this cannot be cheap. You, you cannot price it at the, at the price of any, you know, uh, run of the mill, uh, milk bottle or the, the options that you have in the marketplace from various um, listed and unlisted players in, in terms of infant formula. But this is the next generation, right? So you can actually um, replicate human uh, milk um, in 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 lab and and you can uh, do it in a much more um, clean way so it's a better product uh, it's a cleaner product but again price is something which will be um, exorbitant it, it definitely won't be affordable for everyone uh, right from the word go but again if moore's law comes into play this could scale up into something which is relatively uh, affordable over the next say five, 10 years, uh, if not tomorrow. So again, biomilk is another um, good example. I saw uh, in the research, I thought I'll include um, one slide on this one. Uh, so difference between cultivated and the traditional farming. Um, so, you know, you, you isolate the cell, you, you create the cell line, you breed them, you multiply them, and then you harvest uh, and then you enjoy, which is, which is, supposedly a very clean and efficient process um, compared to the traditional farming. Uh, and the terminology is interchangeable. So they, they might call it cultivated, lab grown, cell-based, cultured, in vitro. So they are all, they're all the same things. And here is the end-to-end -end process from cell procurement um, 
growth media scaffolding so scaffolding could be biodegradable or non biodegradable and it it kind of gives this structure uh, which again something like a bioprinting uh, type thing you grow them in in the bioreactor and and then you enjoy the the finished uh, product so that's the end to end sort of um, uh, process some differences between cultured meat and plant meat so i suppose um, technology is the is the sole differentiator for cultured meat whereas plant based is a low tech uh, trade secret based and savvy marketing based uh, business economics whereas cultured meat is is high tech um, higher barrier to entry um, highly regulated uh, difficult to penetrate so the entry barriers are are significantly higher in the cultured meat so i suppose whenever we get any listed um, firm in this space of course there are many challenges that we'll see shortly but as and when we get any listed space and there's a good company called blue nali in, in the fish uh, the seafood and that that is a good perhaps a good candidate i think the valuations will be more um, uh, at a premium compared to the plant based meat and some of the plant based meats are selling at 20 times price to sales with a gross margin of 30% i mean that's ridiculous i will never buy a business which has got a gross margin of 30% and i pay 30, 20 times price to sales uh, i don't know but yeah they they are they are they are traded in the us and someone must be buying someone must be selling them so good luck to them uh economics of cultured meat so yes um, can grow faster um, um, and then but it's it's kind of regulated differently in there so singapore versus us for example and in us again uh, it's a state by state by state regulation whereas singapore has been uh, much more uh, uh, much more liberal and, and guided by science um, i suppose uh, in approving that Uh, the the paper uh, most of you uh, must have read so i read this before i presented sequence scientific last year so i read i read this paper uh, you know a couple of times before i started preparing for my slides of sequence scientific and i was smiling uh, reading this because to me this was you know super ultra bullish blue sky Uh, and again very biased i could i could see where they are coming from they 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 were very biased and they kind of ignored the the risk and and, and i i will show you what i mean by those risk i tweeted recently and i listed some five six factors there which i believe are are critical in uh, getting um, alternate meat um, uh, animal meat in particular uh, approved um, in any in any market but uh, rethink x uh, sounded uh, super biased uh, in their findings there is a much more um, improved uh, it, that report came out recently from uh, uh, what's that uh, bcg um, boston consulting and that's much more realistic and they are saying that in a in a blue sky scenario 22% of the overall protein uh, market uh, 2035 ish will be uh, uh, non conventional Uh, only 22 percent, and that to a bull case. Their uh, base case, I think, is 11 percent or something, which I think is much more realistic because I had that perception as well when I was presenting sequent. Otherwise, I wouldn't have uh, presented sequent, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, but yeah, I read this a couple of times, and I was, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah so this is the one the, the boston consulting group so here they are saying the blue sky scenario of 22% uh, by 2035 uh, but 11% uh, adoption by 2035 is is more likely i think um, and they it's a good report i think it's available if you google you will find it um, uh, it's it's there uh, happy to share with you ishmoit if if anyone um, is unable to find it um, i got it um, shared by uh, a close friend who is on on twitter as well um, and so he kind of um, he keeps sharing good stuff um, so thank you buddy for that and yeah so this one is a good read
so there are certain um, uh, factors um, uh, against this um, plant uh, uh, animal um, cell culture. So one important thing is the animals have an immune system, right? And that naturally protects them against bacteria and other infections. So that is not the case with cell culture. So again, that is something that the regulators will definitely uh, probe and scrutinize before um, giving any uh, approvals. And again, there are local regulatory approvals required as well. Again, consumer and market pool um, is a factor. Uh, then again, there is a, a good um, article is, is lab grown meat healthy and safe to consume from uh, one green planet. You should read that. I think I've got a snippet of that. Um, somewhere here. Uh, so uh, it, yeah. I think the voice is coming repeatedly. Oh, sorry. Is uh -huh. it better now? Uh, it is better now. Or you can just change the headphones from your left ear to the right ear. I think that will be more comfortable. No, no I, I think that's fine. I mean, OK, if it's if it's just fine by you guys, I mean, if it's audible, that's um, fine. Uh, right now, now it's perfectly audible. Yeah, sure. So, um, so this is the tweet that I was referring to. So I tweeted this very recently, and I think, and I'm saying that seemingly disruptive technologies will successfully disrupt when and only when all of these conditions are met. So scale up production, lower the cost to make the business viable. Of course, zero compromise on quality, and market consumer pool has to come into play along with the price. So if you give me a clean meat at three x the price, I'm not gonna buy it. If you give me a, a much um, inferior tasting or texture is not good, I may not prefer to buy it. If you give me a, a similar or a better product at a similar price point, then as a consumer, I may be interested. Uh, if the taste is fine, the texture is fine, the cost is fine, and I see you know um, health benefits and no sort of risk or side effects potentially, then as a consumer, I'll be interested, right? And then, of course, regulatory approval is another critical, if applicable. So it may not be applicable in some of the industrial biotechnology uh, examples. We have some of them um, in this presentation. But for cultured meat, it definitely uh, could be a showstopper. Because many of these companies in cultured meat, um, believe me, they will fall by the wayside. They will disappear in the next couple of years. Very few will survive. And, and those who will survive will demonstrate all of these all so it's easy to you know um, uh, get uh, scary and uh, feel scary or is spooked about disruptive technology but see disruption is seldom zero or one so we all know that sugar is bad for our health and we have got alternatives there. but have we stopped consuming sugar have we stopped eating chocolates no we haven't so disruption is never zero or one it takes you know, a part of the market away in some cases and in other cases, it's just complementary. So you may, you may start consuming more protein. So you'll end up consuming the traditional um, farm um, animal protein, but you may once in a while try these um, cultured meat as well as an option. Uh, and you may keep switching between them. So the both may coexist um, or, or you may just end up eating more protein because, you know, people try out few things. You've been on a, in a gourmet restaurant where, you know, there's something is on the menu for, I don't know, $99. Um, and then you just might try it uh, once um, and, and you just, you know, feel great about it, take a picture, share it on social media and just boast about it. So, I mean, I doubt that, you know, this will be a fundamental, like the, the report that Rethink X were saying that, you know, this is completely abolish and obliterate the, the conventional farming by 2030. I don't think that's going to happen for, for the reasons listed here. And I've seen this example with corn, right? It has been selling in the UK for 25 years, it never really scaled up. Uh, and that's not even the, the animal one that's on the plant side, which feels like you are eating a, a chicken burger, but it's a plant based and it's not, it's not chicken, chicken, it's fake meat. Um, and then again, some of the, um, um, the points that I noted, you know, safety is important genetically, you're genetically modifying cell lines. So European union, we saw what they're doing with gene editing, right? How on earth will they approve something like this? I mean, no, Singapore has been an outlier and maybe Israel is, a, but these countries 
have got a fundamental problem. They are small countries, they don't produce uh, much, whereas uh, Europe, they do these farming, they are farm lobbies across both sides of the Atlantic. Farm lobby in India, I mean, you know, is it, is it, is it really possible to disrupt the farm lobby? I mean, seriously? <laughs> so uh, there's something, and again, this, this, this toxin angle, right? Um, so we in animals urinate and you know and they 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 do the daily cleansing uh, so the toxins are out of their body on a daily basis whereas in bioreactor you are synthesizing these cells i mean how do you how do you tackle this toxin angle there um, at some point in time you know if not the regulators the consumers will will start shouting about it but i think before the consumers the regulators will uh, with some sanity will will start shouting about it as well. So I think it's, I don't think it's a done deal. It's not as as some of the other optimistic research reports um, are highlighting. But what is more potentially possible is the non-food, non non-cultured meat side of things. Where, so example, uh, textile, um, leather industry, um, lab-made silk. Um, so here is an example where you know bioengineering and fermentation can. Um, produce a yarn. Uh, so this is this this is possible. This can disrupt the textile industry um, on a longer term basis because if I if I get an option to have a, a lab uh, made um, leather jacket, I would definitely go for that. But I would not buy you know a, a leather jacket that was created by slaughtering a cow or any other animal. So there is there is that ethical angle as well, and you could you could command a premium for this type of technology, and and the entry barriers regulatory aspect of entry barriers is is quite low as well, because you know it's not it's not an edible product, so that's why I'm saying the biotechnology enabled um, synthesis can disrupt materials and many cyclical sectors like leather, textile, chemicals, construction, as an example. And there is there's a lot of innovation happening. It's a fast uh, pace, fast moving space. Uh, five years could be you know, a, a completely game changer for some of these um, incumbent businesses. So I'm not sure what terminal PE multiple you could do. I don't do DCF, but you know I know people do. So if you're doing a DCF analysis on a leather company or a textile company, or maybe some of the chemical companies, what kind of terminal PE uh, you would be willing to give them? Um, Another example of this ananas and I've uh, got their website. So they are just recycling the, the harvested pineapple waste um, into something which is um, <clears throat> which can be consumed in a lot of consumable items. So how good is that? It's a brilliant economics, right? If you could do this at scale, um, then I think your economics will fall in place and you will start disrupting the incumbents. So this is the example, uh, the lab made um, uh, leather that I was talking about. So look at, look at the pitch, a single biopsy from this cow can make millions of handbags. So, I mean, this is like, you know, the, the lab diamond, whereas the, the natural diamond, but this is, this is a couple of, um, you know, steps, big steps further than that, because here you're not slaughtering that animal. It's a harmless animal. You keep slaughtering them, you and and there are other challenges as well. So the size of the cowhide versus you know the size that you could get in the lab, and it's a fifty billion um, leather goods market. Imagine the potential, right? And, and look at the 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 resource consumption. One square feet of leather requires twelve liters of growth media. So that 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 is that is killing the economies. Moore's law will come into play. The technology will become affordable. We have seen this in, in EVs, the electric cars, the battery technology, the cost uh, is coming down. Same thing will happen in other um, sectors as well. And over a period of time, when the, when the scale goes up, the cost of media comes down, the economics will improve, the cross margins will improve. And then, you know, you will have, you know, perhaps uh, Vitro Labs as a listed play at some point in future, you never know. 
so this is the the gruesome business which trades like an awesome business uh, on the on the us so um this is what i was um uh, tweeting uh, so i said this uh, very recently i said if something is a multi decadal investing opportunity which investors are saying for beyond meat then uh, you still need to wait see so following this webinar don't go and buy any business uh, on monday willy nilly if because i am saying it's a multi decadal opportunity if something is multi decadal then you can wait for a year and and still you should be able to make money so cdmo i, I still say um, thumping the table that i presented it last year the stock prices may have run up it's a multi decadal run so you can buy them even another year later from here and you would still make money but do your own research don't take my word for it i am biased i am super biased right but that's what i'm trying to say if something is a multi decadal investment opportunity you can wait you can wait to validate the narrative with the numbers you can wait to see the sustainability of cash flows the leadership in gross margin i mean these are not leadership gross margins this is this is this is this is shitty margins i mean 30 35% gross margins which business i mean the chemical companies in india make 45 50% gross margin so imagine uh, and then you know you can wait for this story to to turn positive so i was just um tongue in cheek when i tweeted this so if you if you read this economics i am talking about bio cdmo or any cdmo whereas the graph that i am showing is of beyond meat and the reason i tweeted this is because beyond meat is trading at 20x sales ka multiple insane right anyway so ipos worth waiting for um, so i have just hand picked uh, some interesting ones so blue nalu is the is the is the um, seafood one vitro labs is the leather um, one the business is we just saw and memphis meat is another cultured meat uh, so i have just narrated few um, key points in terms of um, who is in so i'm in some some marquee names um, are invested in these um, companies uh, some serious players including the singapore and the temasek of singapore uh, and others so i mean these are the three examples um, that i think uh, i would um, like to screen further when they are um, coming up for an ipo uh, and i would love to track them uh, after listing i may not be buying them on the listing day it depends on the valuation because ipos uh i don't love them because they are never cheap um uh so i try and avoid them um and and only buy them couple of years later when the euphoria is all all gone exactly what i did with lorus labs so i i did not buy the ipo the lorus labs ipo uh, and i and i bought it couple of years later when i thought the valuations were you know uh undemanding Uh, <clears throat> so coming to the last four or five overs, um, this will be good fun. So picture is worth a thousand words, right? So this is what the impact the climate change is causing on the planet. And then sustainability is the motto of bioeconomy uh, industry five uh, vision two. And and look at what's happening. So the earth is warming. Twenty twenty was the second warmest year. carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide are rising right so this is not sustainable and and i think global leaders the the biden administration rejoining the paris accord uh, is a is a key signal that you know the us has woken up um to this uh, challenge and the world is seemingly united to get this sustainability back in place and there's a multiple um, data so you can you can just go through them at your leisure but climate change and sustainability i think are are critical uh, to the um, industry industrial uh, biotechnology and and our wealth creation so if i'm if our portfolios are not aligned to this space uh, today right now then i think uh, we may we may end up buying them at a higher price uh, potentially because the world is seeing the opportunity if we are late then you know we may, we may we may uh, miss the opportunity to buy them at today's price and we may we may may have to um, pay a premium uh, a year or two later 
um, climate change um, again some more graphs so in terms of emerging markets are seeing higher growth so more greenhouse gas emissions more pressure on them whereas the developed in the western economies are showing a flat to declining emissions which is which is good um, deforestation is also not have um, helping either Uh, and again, Arctic um, is one region that is um, really suffering loss of ice cover um, that happens um, every decade, sort of ever since the records have started, the loss of ice cover is equal to the size of uh, France. So that's 500 to 550,000 square kilometers. That's the, the loss of um, ice uh, cover due to global warming in the Arctic region. Uh, and again, um, several um, manifestations of climate change, um, you know, the, the, the glacier that got busted in, in the Himalayan region, I think yesterday in India, worst possible time, the country is struggling with COVID and, you know, uh, that's the, the last thing that you um, should have in a country. But I think it's just India is going through some terrible, terrible time. But you know, times change, guys. I mean, this is probably the worst period. Um, it's one of the worst periods. We have we have seen several challenges from wars to whatnot. And as a country, we have overcome those challenges. So make no mistake, India will come stronger. It's an anti-fragile country. You read Naseem Taleb's book, anti-fragile country is something that the more you attack, the stronger it becomes. The Chinese have attacked the API industry for, you know, um, two decades and they couldn't kill if you cannot kill a business after 20 years of relentless attack, the business will kill you. And now Indian API players have started supplying to China. And, and this will get much worse for Chinese. Um, the Indians are coming for sure because we have the chemistry, we have the, 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 the knowledge um, and we can do the differentiated synthesis which Chinese, Chinese are ahead of Indians in biologics space. Let's be very honest. But when it comes to complex APIs on the chemistry side, India is well ahead of, of China. Um, in formulations, in, in, in generics, uh, India is well ahead of China. Uh, so let's not uh, uh, have any doubt, but yeah, India will get over these challenges. Um, and here is one company that um, is uh, probably gonna take the center stage. A lot of people have spoken about Raj on Twitter and elsewhere. And majority of those have been through all those um, threads. I only see um, ethanol and greenhouse gases, um, uh, C, um, CNG rather, or CBG uh, as part of their thesis. So it's either CBG 5000 ka capex hone wala and ethanol 2G, 1G. So they, they are just looking at what's here and now. None of these guys have um, gone into, you know, what is the driver? The driver is the Praj matrix R&D. It's a technology behemoth. It's a technology gorilla, which is seen as an ethanol play, which is only seen as a CBG play. And the bioprism is just one manifestation of what they have been doing over the last 10 years. They have invested significant amount of money in Praj matrix. And this is Bioprism is in, you know, they've got bioplastics and other um, renewable chemicals, but they've got other businesses as well. So high purity in this vaccine world uh, and biopharmaceutical capex world. Uh, so so Laurus Bio recently used their um, uh, fermenters and capabilities in their um, new plant, which is almost um, 20 fold their existing uh, capacity. So high purity is a, is a fast growing business. They have got zero liquid discharge, critical process equipment going in oil and gas, bioconsumable. So this is what Christian Hansen type business where they, they do these microorganisms which do go into other industries to increase their yields. And if you don't buy them, your yield would be much lower and then you know you, your economies would be much weaker. So this is like a repeat business and it's a very high margin business for them. They themselves have accepted this in one of the YouTube um, uh, video, I remember. It was Philip Capital's 2019 um, Shishir Joshi Pura last 10 minutes. Uh, do watch them, it's available on YouTube. Uh, 2019 uh, one, last 10 minutes, uh, Shishir Joshi Pura has confirmed that this is their best business. But no one, no one talks about these businesses. Everyone is talking about ethanol, 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 or maybe 
compressed biogas but imagine they have not stopped the r&d so there will be multiple future cash flows coming out of um, this r&d engine as well so it's a technology play it's a serious technology it's one of its kind i think in in the whole world i have not seen any other business which is using industrial biotechnology 360 degree many are into um, biodiesel many are into um, you know bioethanol uh, compressed biogas but i have not seen a single company which is 360 degree so praj is an exception look at the valuations relative to the opportunity of um, the next 20 years right um, so why why did the business not perform so if the potential was so great why the stock has gone nowhere or at least the sales have gone nowhere in the last 10 years so it was a 1000 crore sales company in 2009 if i am not mistaken even today it's a 1000 crore company mota moti right so what 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 so there was this completely disconnect so one of my framework pillar is numbers must match narrative so narrative is strong but the numbers are not matching so why so i i have been trying to answer some of those so i said in 2018 that the recent policy changes have shifted the economics of the sugar industry uh, and the the sugar mills have now got more power to decide whether they want to manufacture sugar or ethanol so they can they, they are free to decide right so this happened in 2018 and then i also um, suggested you know that raj is much more than just ethanol is an api shift from china to india the high purity capex cycle revival theme you know the critical process equipment pollution and environment theme for sure import substitution theme uh, and r&d i have always been impressed by their r&d um, so it's not that i have suddenly turned bullish on raj um, but i have been you know tracking this business for many years now and i have always highlighted raj matrix and um, their capability uh, i think it's a very underrated player um, in 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 the entire um, globe i mean i'm not just talking about india india mein to koi competition hai nahi but i'm just talking about globally it's an end to end play um, so what went so wrong so again i'm looking at these three pillars to so um, rear view mirror investing is very easy right so this is something that is giving us a peek into the future so what went so wrong what what has changed in the industry structure so previously there was no gst right so you cannot export ethanol from so up is rich in sugar um, production and ethanol production but transporting uh, bioethanol from up to mp there is a chungi so the gst wasn't there so that came into place in 2018 then the satat the the sustainable transportation affordable transportation policy the biofuels policy that i have spoke about here came into place but even after those and the paris agreement us joining is a recent one but even after these policy announcements the dynamics did not shift the reason was that the 2g technology was not readily available and 1g the sugar mills the balance sheet was stressed so they couldn't have gone for capex because banks were not willing to lend them um so nothing happened uh, since the the announcement of the policy only recently in the last 6 months or so um there are some some further policy um, changes and now the 2g is also um uh, available and there's omc is all marketing companies are doing the capex so there is industry support so now you see the industry structure is shifting 10 years back this was a not a very healthy favorable industry because of the reasons that i cited but now the shift is visible in terms of industry support and the collaborations they have got almost every leading technology player is having some sort of collaboration with praj why because praj is the only one end to end integrated so from jivo in uh, sustainable aviation uh, fuel to um, to ligos to you know, novo nordis uh, not novo nordis novo zymes uh, ccab um, right so ligos is for their um, uh, polylactic acid uh, you know the the rcm renewable chemicals and and materials so industry structure definitely is improving and when the industry structure improve we saw the it industry example right you have got a grade management right so they had the vision to see industry 5 um, vision to years in advance because they were investing in praj matrix so they have been ahead of the curve so it's an a grade management 
our rd commitment was strong during um, great financial crisis um, so typo it should be gfc and then the passion to find sustainable bio solutions for the world so i've got huge respect for uh, mr pramod choudhury he he always wanted to put sustainability first and and because of his um, background he hails from rural india he always wanted to work for the masses as uh, something which is good for india and of course good for the rest of the world as well because you know everyone wants sustainable solutions at affordable price so a grade management industry structure wasn't positive now it's turning positive business was always good business was always innovative excellent balance sheet they have got net cash of 400 crores uh, essential products and services so sustainability is essential now monopolistic technology so everything is now falling in place the only thing that was missing in my um, uh, view is the industry structure or was the industry structure that pillar has now turned favorable so all three pillars are favorable now i i see a significant um, re rating based on earnings not just hype the earnings will start improving i see a massive jump in roc Um, as early as next year, this current fiscal FY twenty two, and let's see how it plays out. We have to watch it. I am invested. I am. I've been invested in Pras since two thousand and fourteen. Um, forty forty rupees ka bhav hua karta tha, but I had a small exposure. I just want to track the business, and only recently I started adding because I, now I see um, some real um, shift in the industry structure. So that kind of completed my my um, screening framework. and and look at these uh, names right so i i suppose 5 years later there will be much more vaccine play so we have already got some uh, biopharma pharma players not many sugar companies so yes bajaj hindustan is there but it's an exception and most of the people whenever you talk about sugar they say praj as if they are they are synonymous right so ab sugar is there i mean how many sugar players can you count in this majority of their client base is non sugar and i think increasingly more pharmaceutical biopharmaceutical life sciences enzymes clean energy companies like um, total many many companies um, are moving into clean energy uh, bp shell all of them i see reliance also uh, moving into the clean energy space um, as well um, going forward because they know that fossil fuels are not sustainable and it's a very visionary management reliance mind you so they they are always typically they are ahead of the curve and so i i see you know a lot of transition happening um, and they have got um, all these sort of um, technology levers to make the most of the emerging landscape uh, and again as i say it's an end to end integrated uh, process um, yeah so this is all known public domain uh, not much unseen there um uh, in some countries they have got um, dominant so they are they are 65 70% market share in india but in some countries they are 100% right uh, so colombia is one such um, they may be smaller in size but you have to have something to sort of not let the mncs um, um uh, challenge you on your turf in any country right and technologies like second generation ethanol marine biofuels you cannot have an ev Uh, driving a marine um, or a, or a large cruise liner or for that matter um, aeroplanes right so you you sustainable biofuels have got a role even with a 100% ev conversion right because it's it's circular ev 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 may give you sustainability challenges or recycling challenges but this is this is a, a recycled um, a business that allows you to recycle and it also in engages with your um, farm economy so the farmers get something in return otherwise they end up burning that stubble it causes pollution um, uh, asthma what sort of problems that ncr and others uh, other regions in india face almost is an annual event you get rid of all that farmers get something in return and you give the the bio manure back to those farms so you are enriching the soil again so that's a very very sustainable um, circular economy and i think that's where the government of india is moving that was always the vision of praj management um, and i and i and i see you know a lot of so this is another example guys i mean look at the food wastage and what you could do with that wastage 
so over a sixth of all food produced is end up throwing away so that's a waste average person is wasting 121 kg of food right and the wastage is higher in emerging markets where there is shortage of food um, the the masses are poor but the wastage is higher there because i think it's because of lack of education and civic sense um, but even in developed markets uh, there is a significant amount of wastage you could transform all that into um, what not power to biogas to transportation fuel you can use that in home heating um, so a massive business case for a very clean um, energy play not just clean energy i mean it's a 360 degree with high purity the vaccine play um, and other dynamics um, so biogas versus so people say uh, biogas to bahut time se it's a 2 3 decade old story what's changing now compressed biogas is not biogas compressed biogas is is the result of upgrading so biogas you could use in in heating khoke pe chai bana sakte ho usse but you cannot do much beyond that with compressed biogas you could do a lot right you could do a lot so that's the difference and i've uh, got some points here you can read it later on that you know how this is better is a mammoth capex going on so look at the size of the investment over the next 5 years and who is the leader in india now you do the the order book sizing uh, etc um then again r&d is not a slam dunk whether it's any any biotechnology biotechnology r&d in fact takes much longer than chemical r&d right and they have so far invested 260 crores since 2009 uh, and several um, uh, technologies have been commercialized as as a result of this r&d but they are not stopping r&d they are continuing with that so there will be a 3g and and there will be a 4g and there will be other revenue streams that will come out so it, it that makes the business sustainable um and again they have spoken about um, the r&d innovation in their con call so this extract from um, may 2020 con call extract from annual report um, last year so they have been vocal uh, and i have been vocal um, uh, as well uh, so i think i think it's a it's a good um, good business uh, some of their core competencies this is a this is an unseen um, angle in praj um, i suppose so they are into this probiotic so this is this is this is for the dairy this is not ethanol this is not compressed biogas this is dairy probiotics and that's the patent and they've got several of such patents so they are quietly doing a lot of research and it results in an explosion at some point in time it's like a, it's like a, a a volcano that you believe is dormant is just sleeping and it explodes all of a sudden and then you realize are kya ho gaya so um this is the bio consumables um Uh, it goes into um, uh, the the brewery business it goes into ethanol uh, business uh, and they have explained you know the economics how it improves the yield and everything and this is a this is a repeat business so capex is one time the maintenance of that plant is a repeat business and the the uh, micro uh, bio consumables are are a repeat business so it's not just a capex um, capital uh, um capital goods reinvestment capital cycle revival play it's not purely that yes it's that because um, cbg and ethanol is a one time capex but it will continue to happen over a period of time and after the capex someone would have to maintain that plant and then there is bio consumables microorganisms play as well and here is the vaccine angle so this i have um i'm not disclosing you know which plant is that just to maintain the conf- confidentiality of that customer they have got some appreciations from um, both indian and overseas mncs as well uh, in terms of the high purity installations that they have done and and i was saying this in last year right that you know you have to read their annual report um, they have been very positive about vaccines and injectable segment and high purity i think so this is from a from a vaccine formulation and look we discussed about the vaccine opportunity imagine what it means for upgrading the existing sterile plants and what role raj high purity could play there so i mean there's massive room uh, for um, uh, earn 
earnings uh, recovery uh, coming from high purity uh, alone. Uh, so recently, um, uh, Laurus Labs acknowledged their contribution along with some of the other suppliers and look the kind of players that they have been um, uh, shoulder to shoulder in, you know, putting this mammoth capex uh, for Laurus Bio in place. Uh, and and they have got more capex coming online. So if, if this is a 10 year growth story, which I believe it no doubt is along with many other businesses, Praj will have, you know, a significant uh, stake in in providing the, the, the fermenters, the bioreactors, um, you know, the critical process equipment, the end-to-end -end project, project management. So I think there is, there is, a, there is a significant um, scope of um, earnings recovery and ROC recovery here. Some of their collaborations, um, Baker Hughes gave them, you know, a certificate. I mean, it's a technology behemoth. And, and oil and gas industry needs, um, uh, industrial biosciences uh, because otherwise it's it's not sustainable so you need you need enzymes um, uh, in in the oil and gas industry so they have got relationship with many of the oil majors globally so it's not just an india play it's a, it's a global play uh, on sustainable aviation fuel um, on various uh, advanced biofuels and biochemicals from forest residue as a feedstock so they've got this um, a partnership with Zcap. Um, they have got 10 year partnership in place uh, with Novozyme. So, I mean, economics is, is, is excellent. Um, uh, again, so this is an interesting slide. So fossil based chemicals, 90% um, of these um, can, uh, fos can, can be changed from fossil resource from using crude oil to, to bio crude. Bio crude is, you know, the sustainable um, from um, rice straw, sugar straw, sugar cane straw, you know, any any agri waste could be used as a as a source uh, to do at least ninety percent of the chemicals. And it's a it's a huge uh, market. It's a multi trillion uh, chemicals market. So uh, imagine imagine the potential. And again, um, our Doxab has been very. Um, uh, generous in helping us out analyze these businesses uh, look what um, he's talking about um, the cellular app technology and that's the reason i follow him because he is a science professional he's a pharmacologist he has got no idea about finance numbers um, nothing and he doesn't need it to be honest with you because he understands science inside out and and i've not seen any analyst in india who understands the science. If you're investing in a science business, you know, you have to have the knowledge of science. You just can't play with the numbers alone, right? Because numbers sometimes will be visible three, four years out. And the stock may be giving you an opportunity to invest today uh, when, you know, the, the, the science is unseen. Um, so here, uh, you know, CCAB is talking positively about um, them. You could, you could Google, you could look up this tweet. You can translate what it means. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, potential uh, at a global level um, for Praj. And again, this is the opportunity which um, bioplastic is one of them. Um, imagine the size of uh, the addressable market over a period of time for a company like Praj. Um, some of the con call extracts, I'm not going to read them word by word, but yeah, you have to uh, read that you know they're they're talking very positively about the business and where it can go in the next two to three years um, and here is a appreciation from uh, baker hughes and some some other um, uh, documentation in terms of their bio products you, you should um, you know go and research it further uh, and here is a comparison. So this is my preferred slide. Yeah, so this is this is the one that I was talking about, the, the Shishu Yoshipura. So last 10 minutes of this, uh, he spoke about that bioconsumable business. The whole the whole um, interaction, it's a QA. Uh, it's it's worth your time. It's only one hour long. Uh, you should you should read to this. It's available on YouTube. You can just uh, Google. Uh, but look at the dynamics, and I'm comparing it with GMM Fordler. So GMM Fordler was at one point in time valued at 15 times price to sales. Today, I think it's at 10 times price to sales. The cash flows have not moved. 28 crores, 27 crore, right? 
ROC is about 30%, which I believe uh, Praj will also report this fiscal, right? Uh, if not uh, immediately, maybe next year, but Praj is getting there. And I think it's, it's not a one trick pony, unlike glass line reactor, which is where GMM is. It's a good business, but it's not a great business. If I'm perfectly honest, I wouldn't give 10 times come multiple to a business like GMM Fordler. I can give 10 X to a business, which is much more sustainable which has got multiple optionality and growth drivers, not just one um, significant dominant area of uh, cash flow like GMM has. Praj, as we saw in that uh, mind map, it has got multiple um, um, sources of um, cash uh, and, and it's an R&D play. So uh, after so much uh, bullish talking, uh, there have there has to be you know some sanity check in terms of what the risks are. I think the single biggest risk is uh, coming from um, the government globally. It you know because um, for example in India the Aath Nirbhar Bharat is is a recent um, initiative that uh, the BJP government the NDA government has taken. Previous governments have not been um, conscious or um, proactive about that. So that's a, that's a positive trigger, but it's also a risk in the sense that if, um, if there is a U-turn on this policy front, then uh, you know, uh, it could um, derail the story or, or, or delay the story, if not derail. I think derail is a wrong word because they've got multiple um, triggers, but it could, it could delay uh, the, the ROC expectations and the earnings growth expectations. Um, so PE, I don't think is the relevant benchmark because it's 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 optically higher because the earnings are uh, are subdued because of so many factors the earnings i think will recover but the other risk is ev i think is a direct competitor but ev cannot replace the entire clean energy landscape so air um, and water is one example uh, plus also you know the farm lobbying so in europe you know there is a penalty if you're not using biofuel or not blending the requisite amount of biofuel there's a heavy penalty and I think something along those lines may uh, come into force in India when we have the capacity and we have those flex engines, right? So 20% blending, maybe 15% blending is okay. But uh, I suppose there will be an indigenous manufacturing of um, flex engines like we have in Brazil, in India. Uh, and some of those um, uh, economics will change. They will be, you know, dedicated. So if you go to Brazil, you can have an E85 or an E100 um, from a petrol pump, but you can have the fossil fuel as well. So something like this will happen where Alliance will have multiple options in their petrol pump. You can decide what you want. Uh, and, and it's a circular economy. So that I think is an upside risk. And the farmer gets something in return. Um, then there are other um, possible upside risks. So bio, biomethanol, uh, India has got rich resources of coal that could um, help in diesel, bio-sustainable diesel. Uh, R&D is not a slam dunk, so it's a continuous push and it's a major entry barrier. So you cannot create another Praj, right? You either buy out Praj or you start from where they started and go through that painful period of gestation. Um, there, is, there is no other uh, way you could replicate a Praj. So a business that is almost impossible to replicate commands a premium. Uh, biotechnology R&D is a higher risk. So uh, you have to have an anti-fragile mindset that I will do 20 investments, 20 experiments. 15 of them would fail, but five of them will give me my revenue stream for next 30 years. That's how these um, organizations play um, in any R&D, uh, whether it's industrial or, or human uh, pharma, they all have a large portfolio of R&D investments. And, and most of them uh, fall by the wayside. That's the nature of the beast. They get some learning from those failures as well. But I think, you know, a, a very few successes uh, could give them disproportionate uh, fill up to the cash flow. Uh, sugar mills, I think, can now act as a low cyclicality biorefinery. So I think we should stop calling them sugar mills. We should call them biorefineries. Uh, and, and the cyclicality of sugar industry, I think, is gone. So. Balrampur um, stock is making new life highs for a reason. Um, it was always a good business, but I think it can become even better because of that cyclicality factor gone. And now they can be an, more of an ethanol player rather than just a pure player, commodity sugar. Um, 
OMCs with new biorefineries are critical in the whole game. So I think that's a risk. If they if they fail to um, deliver on their promises of capex, then I think you know that will um, that will take a, a negative hit on the the financials of Raj. Crude oil prices can influence policy making uh, potentially, but um, crude is not a sustainable fuel. So even if crude is at say let's say forty thirty five whatever. we know that at some stage it will be 80 again and we have got no control over that pricing so the policy cannot be a function of the crude prices because they keep on fluctuating like a stock price so i don't think that is a high risk but i have just included that um, because again it gives you it plays on your mind um, for sure management bandwidth issue could be an issue because see they have got multiple uh, growth engines high purity bio consumables renewable chemicals so in in light of the fact that ethanol and compressed biogas is is, is taking all the 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 hogging all the limelight these uh, future growth drivers or verticals should not be sacrificed so ideally they should have a, a, a dedicated pnl ceo ceo managing each of these line of businesses to make sure that they are on top of their game as far as future sustainability is concerned high purity i know they are doing already an exceptional job uh, rcms and bio consumables are relatively very small today but as they scale up i think they sh- they deserve a dedicated ceo and you know sort of a, a strategic business unit sort of uh, structure uh, with uh, you know pnl accountability receivables uh, rising because again it's a b2g business to an extent um, could be an issue Uh, however i think it's a retail business so oil marketing companies if they are selling bioethanol consumer is paying them in cash i don't expect this um, to be a, a significant challenge um, uh, but yes i nevertheless is a is a is a risk uh, so finally um, just conscious yeah we have gone massively over uh, our promise but i wanted to do justice because cutting corners is not right and so here is a is a is a is a checklist for you guys if you know the economics of the business inside out um, then you know you can directly invest if you don't know the economics of the science if you if you don't know the science you know the economics of the cash then something like a cdmo may be a better option for you and if you know nothing if you are a complete layman you don't know and you don't have any um, uh, knowledge of finance or, um, or investing you don't understand science either then i think index funds or etfs is the best option for you bank fd is not because bank fd won't you know uh, would underperform the inflation so you have to have you know uh, an index fund or an etf uh, so don't directly invest in any of these stocks if you are if you don't understand the science or the or the economics and the psychology of the business um see don't never sacrifice the sleep um, right so don't do anything which makes your life terrible there's a lot going on uh, in everyone's lives their friends and family members are struggling so be be rational be sensible and use this um go back look at your portfolio think what you need to change and also have this framework in front of you and be honest with you that you know where where do i fit in in these three buckets and then make a an informed rational um, decision so if someone is looking for etf i've got um, some options uh, for you um, here uh, and finally again this disclaimer uh, please consult your financial advisor before acting on it this is just for education uh, purpose uh, i am not say be registered neither i am a science expert so excuse me any of the scientists out there listening to this um, uh, apologies if i uh, have twisted anything um, to the best of my knowledge i have done the research uh, and i have been following this space for almost two decades now but again i am not a scientist i am not a science person so homework for you guys um, look at your portfolio and see how um, aligned you are uh, to this because this is coming you like it or not doesn't matter this is coming this is the future and if your portfolio is not aligned to this you have to have some sort of you know exposure through an etf or something uh, otherwise um, i don't think you are um, doing justice because the future is bioeconomy 
Uh, I think we can stop here, um, Ishmoit, and maybe take a few questions. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm okay. I can answer as many as I can. I'm not sure how many questions are there. And so maybe... there, are, there are more than 500 questions in the queue. <laughs> uh, maybe if you could filter some, uh, and I'm happy to maybe have uh, my lunch and maybe we can record a Q&A and then do a combined. Uh... It's, it's, it's just a suggestion from my side. So can we just record all the questions and answer uh, tomorrow in the morning and then we'll make the so presentation. I, right? my, my diary is completely, so I'm traveling tomorrow. And okay. I, okay. I, could, I could do it um, at any point today um, after it, some rest and some food. Um, I, I'm happy to take some questions, but I'm more than happy to record it. It will be a live session. Uh, um, but if you have got any, you know, very burning questions, if you think that um, they deserve um, immediate right. response, I'm happy to take them. Just give me five minutes, sir. I'll just open the Google document. No worries. Just a Sorry about the torture, guys. I mean, uh, it took me three and a half hours, um, roughly. So I enjoyed it. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if you guys did. Uh, hopefully, it made sense. Um, let me know um, your feedback. I won't be on Twitter um, uh, for um, rest of this weekend. Uh, but yeah, I will. I will probably be back on Monday and and look at some feedback. Um, don't ask me questions there. Um, and definitely don't ask me a question on a DM because ask me um, on the main Twitter because if I respond, then everyone gets uh, benefited. Um, right, so I'll just share the screen. Uh, just a second. Right. Mm. Uh, is the screen visible? Yeah, I can, I can. So there's something on Rallis is the number two line item. Uh, right, so I'll, I'll yeah. just uh, filter some of the questions. Uh, so I think, uh, this is one question uh, which is there to understand the business potential or best investment opportunity in companies engaged in CRISPR or Cas9. Do we need to know the technicals or these techniques as to which company is able to do it better, which company has the edge over the other when it comes to practicing such processes? Correct. Yeah. So number one, so the, 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 the investing framework, the three bucket, I know the science, I know the economics. So that's, that's under that category. If you, if you don't know both of them, then you better not directly invest in players like CRISPR therapeutics and others. Right. Uh, and just filter some of those uh, questions. So uh, someone asked, like, there have been many questions on Rosari biotech, but I don't think so. That's a biotechnology I, 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 play. Uh, no, it's not a biotechnology. It's a chemicals play. Right. It, it, the name is a misnomer there. And, right. Yeah. Right. People, uh, I think it's a textile chemical play. Right. Yeah. Uh, does peptide synthesis also come under uh, gene and biotechnology? Yeah, so peptides, uh, large peptides, insulin is a peptide. Um, and there are many peptides uh, that Biocon and many other players globally are working on. But peptides um, can be chemically synthesized. So like Newland is into oral peptides, right? right. And it's difficult to crack uh, as a chemistry because in the gastrointestinal, it, it breaks. And that's where the technology comes into play to protect that. Uh, and take it all the way into the intestine where it, it's absorbed. So that's where this oral peptide technology that Newland have um, will come into play. But yeah, peptides, generally speaking, majority of peptides are biologics or, 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 or biologicals. I think there's just one question which I will address because I've received this question like six, seven times over the mail and over okay. Twitter as well. So there's this question about your views on Lhasa Super generics related to animal APIs. I haven't heard much of it. Uh, so again, we are not SEBI registered, but uh, it's not a good quality company in our view. You just need to go and study the, you, you, you just need to go and study what happened with the demerger, right? So uh, I think yeah. it's not, it's not a high quality company. I'll just, because seven or eight times I received it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yes. Right. Uh, I think some of those questions we have answered as we progressed. Uh, right. Right. So uh, again, this is one question which has been asked repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So uh, someone asked, what is S4NL and what are the future growth prospects of S4NL? <laughs> yeah. So right. uh, it's the sequence engine, Newland and Loras. Um, so these are my top four um, CDMOs um, uh, as, as the weightage. Um, uh, future potential. I mean, I'm invested. I've been adding. 
um i believe that they have got a massive runway so when i went on the dt in now interview uh, the pharmaceutical industry wasn't doing well right so it, everything else was flying around and i was confident then and i'm confident today i'll be confident tomorrow these businesses have a sustainable um, runway uh, and, and i'm and i'm convinced but i'm tracking them uh, if yeah. my thesis change i will change my stance but i may not tell you that i've changed my stance so you have to do your own right. homework uh, i'm convinced as on today right sir and uh, one more question is how to identify moat in a biotechnology space or for that matter in any upcoming healthcare space yeah so read those annual reports read those con calls google youtube uh, try and understand the science um, understand the competitive landscape uh, you have to understand that to get you know a, a perspective on which is so i'll give you an example how many indian companies are in us selling biosimilars just one so there has to be a reason right if it was damn easy then everyone would have been there so uh, every granny and their uh, dog is in us uh, selling oral generics right so there has to be a reason so you have to have to have a, a broad uh, perspective read us listed businesses those those annual reports uk listed businesses those annual reports and that will give you you know ahead of the curve sort of um, perspective uh, rather than just um, कुएं का मेढक वाला नहीं इंडिया की एनुअल रिपोर्ट पढ़नी है करके राइट राइट सो आई थिंक दिस इज एन इंटरेस्टिंग क्वेश्चन सो आई जस्ट आस दिस वन दैट इन टुडेज वॉलेटाइल एंड फास्ट चेंजिंग वर्ल्ड वुड यू स्टिल रेकमेंड इन्वेस्टिंग विद मल्टी डेकेडल व्यूज इज इन लाइक या नो नो सो अंडरस्टूड इन्वेस्ट विद दैट पर्सपेक्टिव बट डोंट होल्ड फॉर दैट लॉन्ग सो व्हेन 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 डू व्हेन डू यू सेल इफ यू नीड मनी यू नीड मनी यू सेल then if the thesis change so it could be the promoter management it could be the industry structure it could be the business any of those or all three of those if that changes you exit so i i am i buy today with a 20 year horizon but i i won't be investing for 20 years with my eyes closed i'll be tracking each and every quarter right right i think and uh, this is one question so uh, many people have confused the healthcare space with being one particular sector but within healthcare space there are many diversified sectors yeah so, yeah. so i i tweeted recently there were 9 right. or 10 different sectors complex api is just one then there are biologics then there is cdmo there is branded right. generics there are us generics which is more of a commodity play so yeah there is no such, such sector as a pharma pharma is not a sector at least in right. my head there is no such sector as pharma there are 10 to 12 different spaces within pharma and each of those are sectors in their own right because the dynamics the economies are completely different radically different right right uh, so there are a couple of questions on valuations so uh, mm. should we take one yeah we yeah, are more than happy right So someone has asked on uh, is sequence scientific and Lawrence Labs a rare view mirror story and overvalued or do you fathom that it's a beginning of the long term consistent growth story? Yeah. So um, when I tweeted in 2019, it wasn't a rare view, and so you should have invested back then. Um, if I am invested today and if I am adding today, then uh, I think it's a it's a it's a forward looking. So I tweeted very recently on Lawrence. I said that you know this is a potential of giving birth to three large caps over a period of 15 years or so right, right. sequent if you look at the dynamics i'm not sure whether you uh, saw my uh, webinar the detailed one the economics of the business says that it should be a 40% roc business 25 to 30% ebitda very sticky difficult to enter us um, there is no player who is animal api focused either in china or india with regulated play so sequent is the only such player the economics is fantastic you are giving 15 ka multiple to you know ifi businesses uh, if i could put it that way so why do you think the valuations are expensive i don't think so i'm i'm very comfortable with valuations right right and uh, i think then there are some portfolio specific questions so we won't be getting into any stock recommendations or stock specific questions so we won't be able to answer those uh, we'll just take another three four more questions sir and mm -hmm. i think after that we can maybe have a right uh, just a moment kuch majedar question puche yaar kuch challenging right so there is this question ki how will bio uh, 
agri impact companies like aztec life sciences who are in herbicides and fungicides business yeah so definitely they have to so they have not publicly declared so rallis and upl i think are the two that i know are actively investing in biosciences in in agri i don't know whether bharat rasayan or aztec life sciences aztec i am invested i have not sold a single share but i have been invested for 10 years so my acquisition price is very different uh, and and some of the other examples um, they may so sumitomo is into um, um, biosciences bear crop is into um, biosciences i know they do bio pesticides and gene editing and all the rest of it but i'm not too sure about what are the other because they are tight lipped uh, i know astec is putting a, a, a fresh r&d center so they may be as a godrej group they are progressive traditionally um, so i don't know they may be having some plans but um, i would be worried if it's a pure chemical based because i think sooner or later the policy framework will come into play right right I think that's an interesting one uh two or three more questions i'm trying to find more more interesting ones and uh, cro cdm ko chhod do yaar 2.5 ghante ka presentation hai wo dekh lo na ha sir cdm wale nahi puch raha <laughs> right i think uh ha cro cdm pe kafi aa rakhe gmm fodler kya keh rahe few days back let's read that one ha few days back sajjal sir has compared gmm fodler with another company in a cryptic message ha with- तो प्राज 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 ना बोल तो दिया अभी वेबिनार में राइट दो हजार चाहिए थे आपसे चैरिटी के लिए इसलिए नाम नहीं बताया था सर इस समय राइट एंड आई थिंक मोरलेस सर देर देर इज वन कॉम्प्लीमेंट एज वेल I think so more or less. कुछ uh, any rotten tomatoes कुछ अंडे कुछ नहीं कुछ भी नहीं नहीं सर अच्छे अच्छे ही हैं सारे कमाली है यार मतलब नहीं नहीं यार there was one one question that he has been blocked on Twitter by you someone was saying हाँ huh? that someone was saying that they have been blocked on twitter or something yeah so i i enjoy i mean uh, if if you if you if you have been nasty um, i i i just i don't think twice because see blocking is a very easy trait for me utha right. ke button dabaya block kar diya zyada sochne ka nahi na right sir i think we'll we can take this on uh, uh, panacea biotech panacea ha kya keh rahe hain Uh, for Panacea Biotech, what are the risks uh, to the one-time opportunity from Sputnik? What p- part of this one-time opportunity can reoccur? If this opportunity is one-time, how would you value it? Thanks. So I, uh, yeah, so I, I think I answered that. I, I don't think that pandemic will um, disappear, but even one to two year of cash flows, and Panacea is the only company, or is the best place company, is the head of the curve when it comes to Sputnik. because is vsl3 compliant they have the scientists they know how to manufacture vaccine they have been doing this so serum institute and panacea bharat biotech are these two three players um, and bharat biotech is looking at panacea for capacity and and logistical and scientific support so imagine the competence level they have they made some mistakes in the past by uh, leveraging their balance sheet and going for and the capex which did not did not turn out the way they expected it to be but i think vaccine a is a slightly medium term if uh, it should not be a short term opportunity because we today the immunity we don't know it's a six months immunity or a three month immunity so people have been given two shots and they were tested positive so we we believe i believe that vaccine at least will be a medium term opportunity if not forever opportunity and perhaps it may become a sort of a uh, a smaller 10 20 billion type you know flu jab type opportunity um, going forward so i i believe um, panacea has got fantastic opportunity to just um, deleverage the entire balance sheet with one or two years of operating cash and then build from there right sir uh i think one question is from uh that that top 3 companies you would invest in globally in, in emerging biotech space listed yeah so it difficult so thermo thermo fisher i think is a, is a very um, so i have said this many times i would say thermo fisher is one which is very diversified they are into diagnostics they are into bioreactors they are into cdmo they are very well and their cash flow is the free cash of thermo fisher is about 4 billion plus annually 
10 years, 15 years back, it was 1 billion free cash. So if I could just have one, which it will be, it will be Thermo Fisher and they, they, they are masters of acquisitions. They keep, they keep acquiring uh, businesses, but I think, um, Sinjin is a good play. If someone is restricted and you cannot invest in a Thermo Fisher, then I think the next best option could be, uh, could be Sinjin. Look at Stellis. It's an A-grade management if you are restricted towards India. So I tweeted this many um, days back. I said mother, daughter, and uncle, right? Ma, beti, and uncle. So right. these are the three that I, that I prefer. And uh, so one question which was repeated over and over again. So that was, are there any books or sources which you would suggest for uh, Yeah, so I've reading? named them. I've named them in the references and acknowledgement. So, yeah. Right. Any particular books to read or something? Yeah, so this, um, um, the, uh, the the one from Emmanuel Charpentier and, you know, the, 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 um, the Jennifer Doudna, the, right. the, the code breaker. Code the breaker code is a, yeah, the code breaker is a good one. Um, there are others who so just just Google. I've read code, code breaker. It's it's a big book, but it's a fantastic book. It's it's written in your language, so you will understand it. Right, right. Uh, I think um, more or lesser. Uh, there's some questions on framework, and I think uh, I, so. I've explained my right, framework already done with example them. Example of Praj, you know, I've given you the examples of APIs, the chemicals, the IT industry. And so I think, yeah, I've explained my framework. Right, sir. I'm just looking pharma, for pharma aphthology. So I'm seeing a question there. Yeah, I'm, I'm super bullish on pharma aphthology. So we've been doing this online, digital. We are putting severe stress on our eyes. Um, kids are in, sitting at home, you know, online education, whatnot. WhatsApp, Twitter, everyone is on Twitter all the time, WhatsApp. So this is all, um, you know, giving massive growth opportunities to the to the um, eye care space, not just pharmaceutical, but even, mm -hmm. you know, any and uh, end to end, even even specs and you know, contact lens and whatnot. So I'm I'm super super bullish on this space. Right, right. And uh, there was one on Alchem Labs being in biosimilar space. So I think yeah, you've tweeted I your. I have yeah, I wouldn't rate them above a hetero or an intus. Uh, no, no. Right. Lupin right. is there. Cadilla is there. I mean, you know, so. Sab, sab kuch nahi lene ka na. Right, agreed. So these are uh, some of the questions which are just coming. Uh, so one was, this one is interesting, your biggest failure being in healthcare sector in the last two decades and you're learning from it. Ah, so biggest failure was the Morpin Lab. I've tweeted it many times. Uh, so I bought this um, in 99 uh, and then I saw 2x very rapid rise and then a 95% uh, drop. And I booked loss at that point in time. The biggest learning was that I couldn't see the disruption. So I wouldn't say that it was management's fault. Um, the, the space got, the Laura Tidin space got disrupted. They had the capacities. They took bank loans. They went for that CapEx. And that unfortunate incident happened. And I couldn't keep track of it. So that was my one learning. The other one is I, I, I did not make as much money in Orchid Pharma as I thought I would. Because the, the business was, uh, Sephalosporin was a great business. The promoter was talking positive, but I misread the promoter. So that okay. was my, so I, I did not book any loss. I was fortunate enough, but um, the opportunity cost was massive. So I, I should have read the management better. My learning was that, you know, I now, um, I'm very um, sort of um, uh, bruised and, uh, type with the management. So I right. I read the past annual reports and I see ki 2010 annual report mein kya bola and what they have actually delivered. And I right. do the same with con calls if they are available. So I I know I can read the industry structure, I can read the business. The only joker in the pack is that management. So I I go through their past track record and and I don't uh, over allocate if, if I find them, you know, that they haven't delivered in the past. I may have some small exposure uh, and I build on that if they deliver, but I don't go with a 5% allocation on day one. And so one question which we received over the mails and uh, people are tagging us on Twitter as well to ask is, uh, need your like uh, view, like views on the business of Jubilant Pharmova and in uh, Jubilant Ingrivia. Are they? Super, excellent, both businesses. I'm fully convinced they are in my portfolio. I see no reason to be bearish. Um, 
I think Jubilant Pharmova is a great play on vaccines. The rate at which the vaccination has gone in the US and the capacity and the capability that they have, I, I would expect them to surprise in Q4 numbers in this, this quarter gone by and as well as going forward. Um, they have got Rubyfill and the on-call play, you know, as well, and some of the complex APIs. It's a yeah. well-diversified business, a very sticky cash flow, and valuations are not demanding even today. So that's the reason I was surprised. This co, three hundred rupees we took at the peak peak, because the world was completely collapsing right back then. Right. So, and even in Gravia, I think they have the current capex is not fully utilized. So there is some delta expected from that. But they have got a, a mammoth capex coming on stream over the next two years. There is a two-hour webinar. Um, the management was very candid. Excellent Q and A session as well. So go and read that. So I'm very optimistic on both. And I think the discount with Lakshmi Organics is huge uh, for Ingrivia. IPO IPO is just a stepmother treatment, na? Listed is for <laughs> IPO. Me, usko dress up karke, dulhan ko saja ke, uski uh, barat me, na? Wo alag hi alag game hota hai. Right, right. I think more or lesser uh, most of the questions like some of them are repeating so we won't be taking any stock specific recommendations or uh, those sort of questions so please Bhaiya, framework samjha diya pura gyan uh, de diya you can make your own decision right ab kitna spoon feeding sorry right right i think sir one, like more uh, one or two questions more i think most of them are repeating after that Yeah. So one is on your uh, framework on concentration versus diversification. So I'm 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 concentrated and I'm diversified. So my my top ten fifteen holdings will be about eighty percent of my invested capital globally, but thereafter my discipline breaks and I and I have got a very long tail of many businesses that I love to read about, and, but as a weakness I take an initial exposure to just you know, but yeah my my top. 15 holding 16 holdings will definitely be 80 85% and i think that's concentrated enough right uh, i think one question which has been repeating again and again is on the arc etf uh, as a way to invest in biotechnology I, i think i've covered that right so we won't take that so if you are in bucket 3 then um, science bhi nahi pata hai zyada economics bhi nahi pata hai to etf ke through play kar sakte ho बट डोंट ओवर एक्सपोज डो ये नहीं कि सारा बायोटेक्नोलॉजी का एटीएफ ला के रख लिया हैव हैव अ मिक्स राइट 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 बट यू हैव टू हैव अ डिस्प्रोपोर्शनेट एलोकेशन टू बायो साइंसेस लेट मी वेरी ऑनेस्ट अबाउट इट बिकॉज़ इंडस्ट्री 5 विजन 2 इज कमिंग वेदर यू आर प्रिपेयर्ड और नॉट डजंट मैटर इट्स कमिंग राइट अ I think so. Most of the questions we have taken, and one is on healthcare global thoughts on. Uh, so being in the being in the UK, what challenges you face investing in India? Desi roots, eh, boy? Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, ki hai hamar. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm very comfortable investing in India. Right, sir. And uh, I think this one has also come up multiple times. Ki what? How do you view average income? averaging up yeah so you have to average up so um, so for example crafts bio all all losses um, decades or well years of losses um, you can take a very small token exposure just to track the business when the earnings recovery starts then you average up don't go and there and and take 10% stake in any business right and, and without understanding it let them perform let them perform then you average up Averaging up is the only way. Or right. no option here. Any. I think this question is also interesting because valuations in this sector are just out of whack. The valuation of diagnostic firms and why is it higher than pharma stocks? Ah, so out of hand. Diagnostic is 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 expensive. I think uh, COVID opportunity is giving them near term fillip. But uh, yeah, I think the the entry barriers are decent. Uh, but I. and the economics roc roe is better than hospital for sure but i think yeah some of those valuations are um, are insane because their pricing is also regulated see right. not in export business see the, the only business i like in india is one that are globally competitive not locally competitive so pharmaceuticals vaccines biopharma cdmo it 
specialty chemicals these are five six pockets that are globally competitive we can take any one um, uh, head on in these businesses whereas banking for example rbi ka license hai to chal raha hai many other industries are very domestic oriented they are protected so i i believe they are commodity because some license some unfair um, advantage or blessing from the regulator is protecting those industries so i believe in investing in industries where india has a proven record of global leadership right right sir i think uh, there is one question which has been repeated but i would just ask them to watch the iic presentation so uh, they are again asking about the valuations of cdmo i think it is very well covered in that presentation yaar wo burger fake meat ka burger 20 times price to sales mein bik raha hai log khareed rahe hain daily khub trading ho raha hai 30% gross margin no no um, pnl mein kuch profit aa nahi raha hai to i don't know how you value um, see to value a business you need to understand it first if you right. don't understand the economy or the dynamics of the business you can you can only value what you understand if you don't know what you are valuing how will you value it this reminds me what sanjay bhattacharya says that your understanding of business drives the valuation no 100% aur kaise value karoge jab tumko pata hi nahi hai agreed sir and uh, there has been one on this company over and over again uh, what are your views on the injectables business of kaplan point laboratories ha to injectable injectables a risky business uh, i have not done any detailed analysis on kaplan um, i think i think it's not a bad business uh, but i have not done any research injectables is a good business it's a high risk business see if you are into us injectable space then your um, sterile uh, compliance has to be spot on kyunki agar kisi din thappad pada to jor ka padega right, right? so cdmo i think is a better b2b is a better option uh, and with a proven track record um, so i will be much more comfortable holding something like a, a cdmo player whether it's loras newland or zingine uh, over uh, something like a, a kaplan lab because hikma is one that i have invested in and i believe there is lot of capacity that is just on the verge of coming in the injectables space so the valuations will take a hit at some point in time and that's right. the reason i like innovator synthesis cdmo because the molecule is commercial patent protected and some of these indian cdmos are making 90% gross margin so their blended gross margin is 55 because their generic api is 40% and the 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 smaller part is 90% but as the smaller part scales up their gross margins will expand further and then the natural operating leverage will come into play which will further improve their uh, operating margins so right. i would rather invest in in those businesses and uh, again this is one question from my own side is that uh, when we look at the valuations of the bio cdmo listed abroad So mm. some of them trade at 50 55 times nahi abhi abhi 50 ka nahi hua i was checking abhi thoda sa mellow down ho gaye i think they are Achha. they are 30 35 now but at at one point they were they were 50 uh, and again it's a very misunderstood space so uh, anthem biosciences just hmm. just take over it's not a pure play bio cdmo they do branded generics as well right so, so you need to understand the business right sir. Stellis Biosciences is a is a pure play bio CDMO, right? But but not Anthem. Anthem is into generics, branded generics. If you do some research, uh, but on the um, on the those um, the Chinese players, the growth rate has been significant. Right. Uh, so I think I think twenty five thirty times is a reasonable um, expectation, assuming that they will continue to uh, grow. And there is a there is a there is a demand for um, the biologics um, uh, capacity and capability globally. So I think those valuations they can yeah fifty they did touch I think last year at one point in time but the earnings have um, recovered since so I think today they are about thirty thirty five x right I think sir most of the questions are done now some of them are very stock specific and uh, they are not related to biotechnology so I think we might ignore them as well yeah. so uh, I think uh, one last question we can take is uh, yeah, what yeah, sure. What is your take on the nutraceutical sector? Oh, super bullish on nutraceuticals. I think it's a growing space. Um, um, probiotic is one area. People are getting more and more health conscious. Um, 
So probiotics, I think, um, are here to stay. The dynamics will improve. I think India as a country with a large population base um, has got a role to play both on the domestic side consumption, domestic consumption, as well as as the the export potential. And that's one of the reasons I like Laura's Labs because their nutraceuticals, the patterns that they have, is completely unseen. Not many people talk about it. But if they demerge that business tomorrow, then the value unlocking will happen. So uh, I think I think generally speaking, it's it's a good space to play. Right, right. Uh... i think more or less sir, we are we are done so i don't know uh, maybe we do not track advance in time so we won't be able to answer that question particularly but shar bora is asking what went wrong with advance enzyme so i'm not sure what went wrong so the valuations were never cheap um, they have a moat in uh, uh, seracio uh, peptidase um, and some of the other enzymes uh, i know nalanda have invested recently but i tweeted um, even when loras bio invested i would rather be comfortable with something like a loras bio if i were to play the enzymes space over uh, an advanced uh, enzyme i think somehow there is um, the growth has not been as robust um, as market expected when it came uh, for an ipo i think the ipo ipo ke baad 400 450 400 ka bhav tha in 2016 or something and it has not made a high whereas if you look at the pharmaceutical space um, tom dick and harry have been on life high especially in the small and mid cap so something is wrong uh, i have never studied the business in any great um, detail to pinpoint exactly what's the reason uh, but if i were to play enzymes i think i'm good enough with loras bio right and sir one last question i think after this uh, we'll be done so uh, one uh, like i've received this question 20 30 times this is uh-huh. by asking so someone's asking your view on healthcare global uh, i think that's a so hospital publicly, chain so right. publicly disclosed um, uh, it's an investy company i like their onco um, play um, so they they are they are a focus play the kind of technology that they are using right so intuitive surgical if someone knows in us they use the divinci um, um surgical platform uh, at scg and cancer is a very sticky uh, business unfortunately because you people don't let the patient die right so uh, and when you when you go into this cancer therapy you don't decide how much you will spend right because jaan bachane ke liye sab kuch karta hai to uh, i i know it's not the right way to look at this business but that's how the reality is that right? you know it's a very sticky business they they went for a massive expansion balance sheet pe hit hua but now the private equity have come in i think the the business is on road to recovery um so i'm 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 positive uh, my entry price was in 60s and 70s so i thought there was plenty of margin of safety at that point in time and when i see earnings recovery it won't happen this year because of uh, covid unfortunately but at some point in time i would definitely like to average up right sir i think just one last question of the day uh, what do you think about natco in the long run because i want natco we have received it a couple of times Yeah, so Natco, Natco is a good play. I, I, I have investments there. And last I bought was during the March um, meltdown, साढे चार सौ पांच सौ के भाव के आसपास. I think, see, in if you look at the whole landscape, many people talk about revly bid, but no one has actually thought about the whole end-to-end supply of the supply chain of revly bid. So there is an API, there is um, there is a formulation. Which is a capsule API को capsule में भरना है and then there is legal litigation and front end right there is the partner in the US right where where do you think is the is the complexity in this whole chain I think in my head it's either at the partner end in distribution litigation or in the complex API Natco is not making that complex API and no. I won't tell you who is making it's one of my uh, investy companies that's a hint but it's not Natco Natco is not making the API of Revlimid. that company whosoever is making the api of that that's where the moat is and you will see the results in fi 23 okay quite interesting right that could be the real unseen trigger in fi 23 that's one of the triggers for that api company by the way right. there, are, there are multiple triggers right right i think more or less we are done sir so uh okay okay i i i definitely enjoyed um interacting with you all i think it's about 4 hours so it was really a marathon a boring session 
मच मोर बोरिंग देन दिस सी डी एम ओ वन वो ढाई घंटे का था रिकॉर्ड तोड़ा है आज चार घंटे किया है बट होप फुली सम वन आई नो टू थाउजेंड पीपल लेसन अगर दो चार लोगों का भी भला होता है तो आई फील वेरी हैप्पी परफेक्ट ग्रुप का भला हुआ है सोसाइटी का भला हुआ सेटिस्फाइड विद दैट अलोन राइट सर थैंक यू ईच एंड एवरी वन ऑफ यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग द वेबिनार एंड कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटिंग टू द परफेक्ट फाउंडेशन yeah last last but not the least uh, i would like to uh, thank um, siddhant notial you in particular because the graphics the role that you played the turned around so i used to send him slides with the content used to turn them around asap sometimes you know within an hour or so so your help has uh, been of immense importance and the graphics guys you see those images and everywhere on almost every slide that that's it for you siddhant notial so i thank him um, really from the bottom of my heart and i also thank um, dr puneet bansal i took his um, um, take this brains multiple times he is an encyclopedia and i have been you know um, um, uh, catching up picking his brains on on a variety of uh, things uh, and i'm grateful for um, the fact that he is kind enough he is approachable he shares his time and last but not the least i would like to um, thank you um, ishmoit and the the entire team at soic and all those guys who registered and contributed um, to make this possible honestly speaking i never um, thought and i said this to you many times ishmoit right. that 2000 ka maine nahi socha tha ki itna aayega uh, so thanks for uh, being so generous and helping uh, a good cause um, thank you so much thank you sir it was a pleasure having you thank you thank you